My name is Dr. Shannon Croner and I have a degree in clinical psychology. I've been working with kids with special needs since 2001 and you ask any psychologist, behaviorist, special education teachers and they will undoubtedly say that the rise in developmental disabilities and special needs children it's skyrocketing and I have no doubt that there is a link between vaccines and developmental disorders. So I've had so many parents tell me about their vaccine injury stories with their children and show me before and after videos. Children are sicker than ever. The way that one conversation came about was, wouldn't it be great if people who really push vaccines could address the people who were speaking against vaccines? There needs to be some kind of a public debate so I went to Brittany Vallis, who did the Children's March, a nationwide march on children's health and wellness, and asked her if she wanted to join me in putting together a public debate on vaccines. I loved Shannon's idea. I was in the pharmaceutical industry for about seven years, uh, between being a certified pharmacy technician and a pharmaceutical sales rep, and I've seen behind the curtain with the pharmaceutical industry. Vaccines are a pharmaceutical drug. It's just in a syringe versus a pill. It's about selling this product. And how are we going to expand our target market? I see the same pattern from when I was trained as a pharmaceutical sales rep and how they handle vaccinations. So you keep the message short. You repeat it over and over and over again. Safe, effective, safe, effective, necessary. Safe, effective, and necessary. Vaccines are definitely a business. Did you know, Mom? We wanted to do the event in Atlanta because we felt that it was really symbolic having the CDC right there. We met with the debate team from Georgia Tech, the debate director at Morehouse, and the debate director at Emory. We figured that by going to the debate teams, that there's really no debate that's off the table, and all three were 100% on board. Then they went to their superiors. We were actually told by the Georgia Tech debate team they could no longer speak with us anymore. We were told by the Emory debate director that they need to maintain their message of public health and vaccines are safe and effective. And then Morehouse stated that the biology department did not want this happening. I was surprised when the debate teams pulled out, but at the same time we were really hopeful because the panelists were very excited about this opportunity. We had a, an entire spectrum of people, some who really push vaccines, and the doctors who really, they stick by the CDC vaccine schedule. And then those who are somewhat in the middle of the road. And then we went to doctors and professionals who are more vocal about the risks associated to vaccines. So we had a complete panel of experts, but then once we announced all of the panelists publicly on our website, that's when the emails started coming in. One of our panelists, a vaccinologist, put us on the phone with Dr. Walter Ornstein. He used to be the head of the National Immunization Program for the CDC, and now he is the head of the vaccine department at Emory. He specifically said, I'm not gonna stop this, but I want nothing to do with it. We received an email from our infectious disease doctor who had stated that the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Physicians had suggested to him that it would be a poor idea for him to participate. Dr. Peter Hotez considered it, but then ultimately he had said that he needs to keep his day job in order to feed his family. One of the biggest moments in uh, planning this event was when I decided to contact the godfather of vaccines, Dr. Stanley Plotkin. He's the creator of the rubella vaccine that's currently being used in the MMR and invited him to participate. And in his correspondence back to me, he called us shameful and disgusting. Literally within a week, all pro-vaccine doctors had dropped out one right after the other. We have realized we can't find anybody to represent that side to come to the public. That should be very alarming for the community that does support vaccines. I find it shocking that scientists and the doctors are not willing to have this conversation or stand up for the safety of these vaccines. There is a message in that that really the science maybe is not so much on their side.
When the circumstances change, so does the conversation. We've taken this as an opportunity to really expose the silencing and medical oppression upon doctors and really bring that to the forefront of the conversation. So what we have decided to do is present as much as we can from the perspectives that are missing, videos, quotations. And our panelists who will be there are going to be speaking on that. From neuroscientists, to MDs, to DOs, to medical journalists, to PhDs, we have amazing expertise represented in that room. And it is the first time that all these people have been in one room together. People need to see what's really going on. And if doctors are in fact being silenced, then there's even more reason for there to be a debate like this now. Thank you. Welcome everybody to the One Conversation event. My name is Brittany Vallis and I am a co-organizer for the event as you saw on the video. Uh, we would like to take a moment just to go over some quick housekeeping items. Please keep your cell phones off, especially silenced, uh, so they do not serve as an interruption for the panelists as they are speaking. Um, and enjoy the amazing event. One thing I would like to mention, and the reason why we are also doing this event is because I am also a mother of five children. And when I look at other mothers and other parents and people in society in general, we do have questions. We have questions about pharmaceuticals. We have questions about the food that we eat. We have questions about uh, vaccines. We have questions about public health and the diseases that we're vaccinating against. And what I feel is really important is that we have the opportunity to have those questions addressed and answered by those that are the experts in that field. Uh, what is very important as well for the public to know and understand is that doctors today are very busy. Doctors today have to have so many patients in a given day just to make ends meet. So when we are told to talk to your doctor, and that's all, just go talk to your doctor about it. If you come in with a laundry list of questions, they're not going to have the time to dedicate to answering all those questions. They're not going to have the time to thoroughly give you all the information that you need. So, so many times people are leaving the doctor's offices more confused and frustrated and turn to the internet. The internet is great for some information, it's a great tool, but there's also a lot of misinformation out there. And that is why we wanted to bring this event to you, was to bring together those from a huge uh, spectrum of panelists, huge different perspectives, to actually address those questions that you have together. Not sound bites, but actually go through your questions and have them answered for you. So at this time, I would love to introduce the brainchild behind this incredible event, my co-organizer, and more importantly, one of my best friends, Dr. Shannon Croner. <laughs> Dr. Shannon Croner came up with this idea several months ago, back in January, and we have had a wonderful time planning this together. She is an educational therapist and works with children with developmental disabilities and learning disorders, and I will hand it over to Shannon. Thank you guys for being here and watching at home. Um, just to see this whole thing finally unfold after so many months of working with Brittany on this is just incredible. So thank you. Um, I kind of, I came up with this idea uh, back in January, like Brittany said. I work with kids with learning disabilities, developmental disabilities. I've been doing that for almost 20 years now. And I get, a, and I'm from California, where we have some of the strictest uh, vaccine laws in the nation. And so I get uh, calls and questions from parents all the time on, you know, should I vaccinate? Should I miss a vaccination? What should I do? My first child has autism and I don't know what to do with my second child. And to be quite honest with you, I don't have all those answers. And I figured that um, we need to get down to the bottom of this controversy and really hear both sides of this debate. And so I figured that 
there should never be any debate off the table when it comes to like a debate school. So Brittany and I were speaking and I decided that um, I had asked her what she thought. What about if we went to a university? And we picked, like the video says, we picked uh, Atlanta because of the CDC. And so when we met with the universities, they all were on board because, you know, they debate everything from like global warming to any, anything. And so um, they did not see a problem. And it wasn't until they went to their superiors that they really saw that there actually is a debate that's off the table. And that's the debate on vaccines, whether they're, they are safe, whether they're not, what's the deal? So um, anyway. So, so we, we were very successful in actually putting together this amazing panel. As the video said, we had some amazing um, medical doctors, scientists, and experts represented on this incredible spectrum. Um, unfortunately, several of them have canceled, and uh, it's due to the pressures that they were given from their superiors, from medical organizations, and from others. So because we, those that actually wanted to be, they wanted to be here tonight. Um, they yes, had they signed were. up. They were excited to do this. And then when these um, larger uh, medical associations stepped in and kind of strong-armed them, they had to back out. So when we do feel bad that they were unable to attend. However, what is really exciting is that we have an amazing panel of PhDs, medical doctors, and medical journalists here to speak with you and still address those questions. And we are here to provide you uh, both as much from those perspectives that we are missing and so that you really get a good balanced um, informational session. So we are so excited to announce our panelists. So panelists, would you like to uh Come to the stage and join us. First up, Dr. Bob Sears. Dr. Bob Sears is a pediatrician in California. Dr. Bob Sears is an MD. He is a father of three the author of the vaccine book and seven other books, and co-founder of Immunity Education Group, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing balanced and complete information about vaccines, infectious diseases, and public health issues. Dr. Bob Sears, please tell us what got you initially interested in this conversation about public health and immunity. Very well, uh, Brittany. It, it kind of goes back to when I first started practicing pediatrics 20 years ago. And I had already started looking into vaccine safety in medical school, but I wasn't quite sure what was going on and what I wanted to do as a pediatrician. And one of the first conversations with my dad in the office, because I joined his practice, Dr. Bill Sears, he is very pro-vaccine and he said, you know, Bob, vaccines are great and I know you're investigating them, but, but you know, the, you know they're, they're very important. And, uh, and I said, um, okay, Dad, but what about the hepatitis B vaccine? You know, seriously, hepatitis B for newborn babies? And he's like, okay, okay, Bob, yeah, maybe I'll give you that one. Maybe that one's not that, that important. Um, and, and, and then, uh, you know, so I went on a journey of, 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 of discovery and investigating vaccines and how important they may or may not be. And, um, and then came the California mandates and the, the, the law that made them mandatory to, to put your child in school or childcare. And that's, that's, that's when the game uh, is on for me. And I really uh, kind of embraced uh, the fact that now the rest of my life I'm gonna fight mandatory vaccination laws uh, all over the world, all over the country. And, uh, and that's my new mission. And I'm here tonight to, to really uh, educate people about, about those laws. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. <laughs> Dr. Tenpenny is the founder of the Tenpenny Integrative Medical Center. She's also the founder of Mastering Vaccine Info Boot Camp and Educational Portals. And she is a former director of the emergency department at Blanchard Valley Regional Hospital Center. She, um, Dr. Penny, Dr. Tempenny is board certified in three medical specialties, and her special interests are in chronic pain 
and a unique approach to chronic diseases and cancer. She has taken advanced studies in women's health, breast thermography, and um, bioidentical hormone use, and thyroid adrenal balancing. She's excited about developing the Breast Health Center at TIMC using Mamacare technology and thermography to improve the health of breasts in women of all ages. So, so Dr. Tenpenny, what got you interested in health and immunity? Well, when I was working in the emergency department and I was the director of the ER, my business partner, Dr. Dave Fronsek, died of metastatic kidney cancer when he was 32. And that was what prompted me to look into other forms of alternative types of health. And that was in 1996. I moved to Cleveland to start the Integrative Health Center that she talked about. And then in September of 2000, I got this brochure in the mail from the National Vaccine Information Center meeting. It was just a cheap little brochure on gray paper. I sat on my, on my countertop for months. And every time I went to throw it away, it just ended up back on my countertop. So I thought, well, there must be somebody important I'm supposed to go there and meet. Because I was single at the time, you know. <laughs> so when I went to the, to the meeting, I found it wasn't about somebody, it was about something. And when I came home from that meeting, I thought, there must be more to it than this. I mean, after all, I grew up in a chiropractic family. I wasn't vaccinated as a kid. None of my cousins or their kids were vaccinated. We had no vaccine injury, anybody in our family. And, and I couldn't understand what the big deal was about vaccines. So I thought, well, i got to start somewhere. So I started looking at the general recommendations of vaccination, the, the 1998 version from the CDC, and thought, this is a horrible paper. It's badly written. This can't be what everything is built upon. Well, 18 years later and 30,000 hours of research later, you know, two books, a course, we're, we're starting a vaccine university educational project that opens in November, and all the things that I've done, it's just, you know, the more that you know, the more that you know, and you can't unknow what you know. And I really felt like sooner or later, if people just possibly knew this, they would just stop. Well, <laughs> it's been a whole lot more of a journey than that. But it's something that sort of, um, it's why I feel like I'm here on the planet, is to just keep sowing seeds, sowing seeds, sowing seeds, because you never know which seed's important, you never know where the good soil is, and you never know when it's going to sprout. Mm. That was beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. And next up, we have Del Big Tree. <laughs> Del Big Tree is one of the preeminent voices of the vaccine risk awareness movement around the world. He is the founder of the nonprofit Informed Consent Action Network and host of a rapidly growing internet talk show. The, the High Wire, boasting a thir over 33 million views to date. Dell's multi-pronged approach incorporates legal, legislative, and media actions to expose the fraud, lies, and conflicts or interests that have followed, allowed the pharmaceutical industry to evade standardized safety testing for vaccines. Dell Bigtree is a wonderful medical journalist and Del, please entertain us with what brought you to the conversation of public health and immunity. Well, my uh, career as a journalist and a producer led me to the Doctors Television Show where I worked for six years uh, celebrating great science, great doctors, great medicine. I really love doctors. I had the opportunity to scrub into ORs and shoot surgeries hundreds of times I always joke, if a plane goes down and there is no doctor, I think I'm your second best <laughs> bet. Um, but the truth is, is I um, you know, always did stories about industry and how industry tends to not care about the citizens, especially when billions of dollars are being made. Because of that, I had inside sources, and one of those reached out to me while I was working on the show and said, you remember when I talked about autism and vaccines, and you said that you couldn't cover that on the show because we were pretty entrenched in vaccines are safe and effective. I said, yes. And he said, remember when I took, you know, you said to me that if anything changes, let me know. He's like, well, there's a whistleblower at the CDC that's going to come forward in two weeks and tell the world that they've been committing scientific fraud on the vaccine safety studies, especially the MMR uh, vaccine. I presented that to the doctor's television show. I was 
skeptical whether they would let me do it because we, had, we were really good friends with the CDC and I knew that much of our funding came from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so they said, no way, you're not covering that story. Um, but I thought in two weeks when this guy comes forward, if it really happens, every news agency in the world is going to cover it, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, this would be the biggest news story there is if we have scientists that are committing fraud at the CDC. The guy did come forward, it was online, his recording saying things like, I, I don't know how to live with myself, I feel guilty every time I see a child with autism, I can't believe we did what we did. He's just a couple miles from here, he still works at the CDC, he's protected by whistleblower status. I made a film about him and the parents and the families that have been injured by vaccines and autism called Baxed. We got kicked out of the Tribeca Film Festival and that's when I realized censorship goes far beyond television, it's now in our film industry and it is time that people stand up and start demanding better. We are simply advocates for safer products, just like car seats or cars or anything else we have. We have an industry now that is beyond reproach. You cannot touch them, you cannot sue them, and all of science is protecting them. That is endangering all of our kids, and that's why I am here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Tony Bark. She is the founder and director. She's the founder and director for the Center for Disease Prevention and, Re and Reversal. Not the CDC. <laughs> Not the CDC. Uh, Dr. Bark earned her doctor in medicine uh, degree from Rush Medical College in 1986. She completed her pediatric internship at NYU and pediatric residency at University of Illinois. She trained in rehab medicine and has a master's degree in medical disaster preparedness and response from Boston University Medical School. She's a former director of the pediatric emergency room at Michael Reese Hospital. Dr. Bark has worked as an expert witness in the federal vaccine court and as an adverse event expert in family courts. She has been in private practice in Chicago, Illinois since 1994. And so what got you into public health and immunity? Well, actually the first thing was I had taken a break from medicine after doing two years of residency training after med school and then moved to Israel. And when I moved back, I brought one of my animals, my little Siamese cat. Um, and in order to bring her into the country, I had a vaccinator. And she'd been a healthy cat, born on a uh, moshav, which is like a kibbutz, so a farm. Very healthy. She was uh, just a few months, probably six months at the time. And we, we didn't even give them all at once. I spent three months before leaving Israel to come back with her. And when I got, when she received all her vaccines and we got back to the States, she quickly developed um, abnormal bacteria in the mouth and her teeth all decayed and fell out under the age of a year. She developed asthma and she developed a cardiac, a mitral valve prolapse, a cardiac murmur. And all the veterinary specialists told me it was vaccinosis. And I said, what's that? <laughs> what, vaccinosis? I had never heard of that. Um, and then I went and finished pediatric training. I didn't think that much about it. I was like, okay, they, you know, what I had been told was that we see a lot more generations of animals. We've been vaccinating many more generations of animals than people. And we see that they develop autoimmune diseases and other chronic inflammatory diseases from multiple vaccination and that they're calling it vaccinosis. Um, ran the ER and, you know, finished residency and kind of skipped mainstream medicine and to study more naturopathic, classical homeopathy and other things. And so I, I wasn't really vaccinating very much. I, I had some mercury-free and some DTs and then mercury-free when we could get them. And I was doing some selective vaccination. Um, and then, and I had children, raised a family, didn't vaccinate my child, but you know, it was just because I'm a homeopath and I wanted him to get mumps, measles, rubella because I felt like it's gonna be good for him long-term, him long long-term immunity. But, in 2010, I embarked upon a master's in medical disaster response and preparedness. And the first thing we did was start modeling flu shot clinics. So I went and did the research on flu shots and looked at all the Cochrane collaboration meta-analyses and whatever else I could and looked at what Peter Doshi, who is now an editor at BMJ but was then a postdoc fellow at Johns Hopkins, had written about the, the H1N1 debacle 
and, um, and how the flu shot was pushed and promoted along with Tamiflu by the WHO at the request of a working group called SWE, which was supposed to be a nonprofit, but it was actually three doctors who were all employees of either the maker of a vaccine or Tamiflu. And it, I brought it to the head of my department and said, oh my God, look, at, you need to see this. And we went to DC to go to the Selling Sickness Conference, and he said, look, you know, whatever you, every paper you have to write, I want you to relate it back to and investigate vaccines, safety, and effectiveness, because we need to hear this. And that is what got me, kind of catapulted me onto this stage. And immediately after interviewing Diane Harper and Mary Holland and other people during my master's, Mary Holland said, would you write, a, a, um, would you write one of the chapters? Would you contribute a chapter to our new, um, ep our new a a vaccine epidemic? We're doing a, another reprint and uh, we'd like you to contribute. And then I wrote a, a treatment for a, a movie, which wound up being a very similar treatment to a movie that somebody else had written, and we wound up collab you know, working together, and I co-produced it, and you know, the rest is history, because now I'm you know, this reluctant medical expert, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, hate, hate law, hate courtrooms, <laughs> like, hate testimony, hate writing, and like, this is what I'm doing all the time. <laughs> so, and I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tony Bark. And our next panelist is Dr. Christopher A. Shaw, PhD. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Christopher Shaw is a neuroscientist as well as a professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. Uh, let's see, at the University of British Columbia with cross appointments to the Department of Pathology and the programs in experimental medicine and neuroscience. He has served as a member of ALS Canada Research Committee and was a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Public Health Agency of Canada on Neurological Diseases. He is the author of over 300 articles, reviews, and abstracts. He is the author of a book on the nature of neurological diseases. Neural Dynamics, excuse me, Neural Dynamics of Neurological Disease, ongoing projects in his laboratory focus on potential therapies for ALS, on models of the Gua Guamanium Neurological Disorder, I'm sorry I <laughs> butchered that, ALS, PDC, and on the role of aluminum in neurological disorders across the lifespan. In recent years, his group has investigated the impact of aluminum adjuvants in animal models of ALS and autism spectrum disorder. Chris has served as a frontline medic with a Canadian NGO during the liberation of Mosul, Iraq in 2017. Thank you for your service. Dr. Shaw, please explain to us what brought you to these topics, public health and immunity. Uh, total accident. It, um, as, as, as Brittany said, I am primarily, I have been primarily an ALS researcher. So one of the questions I always get is, what's an ophthalmologist doing, doing vaccine research? And the answer is I'm not an ophthalmologist. I'm a neuroscientist. I have a PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in uh, neurobiology. And I was associated with a vision research group that was studying amblyopia, which is a visual disorder of the brain. And that's why our group came out together from Halifax to, to Vancouver to form a basic uh, research wing. And after a few years, I, got, I found myself getting more interested in ALS uh, as a neurodegenerative disease. And the chairman of the time thought, well, you know, diseases of the brain, diseases of the retina, maybe they're related. That's fine. You know, fill your boots, have fun with that. So I went off and studied ALS for a number of years, and we started tracing uh, an ALS cluster that Brittany mentioned called ALS PDC, which was a, a form of ALS found in the island, island of Guam in the late 1940s, 1950s, petered out in the 1960s. And it was a fascinating disease because it, its expression was something like 500 times higher than Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, here in North America. So we were looking for the clues, and of course, when you're looking for clues for neurological diseases, you, you know, there are genetic uh, causalities for a fraction, there's uh, gene uh, susceptibilities, and of course, there are thousands of toxic molecules in our environment that live in a very toxic, toxic world right now. So we were following that. We did a lot of work on that. 
And then about 2005, and I, I should stress that everything I knew about vaccines at that time was they're safe, effective, and perfect in every possible way, and there's not, no harm involved in them. And I'd been in two armies, so I had, had vaccines for everything probably under the sun. Never thought about it until we decided we were going to look for another cluster of ALS. The other cluster for ALS is a, pet, a student named Mike Patrick who came to my lab about that time. We started looking around for another ALS cluster because when you're looking for a cluster is a large number of people in a relatively short geographical space and limited, uh, limited time period who expressed this disease. Guam was one. The second one came up with the Gulf War syndrome and it was started to be reported on in, in some, some detail in the late 1990s. And by you know, the early 2000s, we were looking at this and we realized that maybe Gulf War syndrome that had a subset of people with ALS that were A, much higher, in, uh, higher levels of incidence than the general population, also much younger. ALS normally strikes people in their 50s, 60s, 70s. These were 20 year olds. So something was odd there. And the epidemiologists who studied it basically came down to two conclusions. It had something to do with the anthrax vaccine, or it had something to do with uh, some of the anti-nerve gas agents that the soldiers were taking. So we started looking at both these things, and we re really focused on the anthrax vaccine because a lot of the soldiers who got it um, had not deployed. So they were not taking the anti-nerve gas agent. They were only getting the vaccines, anthrax vaccine in particular. And we said, well, let, let's just, you know, probably nothing to it. We're just going to look at this. We'll just see what happens. And we did it, you know, we, we have a lot of animal models for ALS. We were just going to go pursue that. We were going to do the same thing that we were going to inject. And it wasn't just aluminum. We tried to get at the anthrax vaccine from a company called Bioport. They weren't having any part of that, as you can imagine. So we said, we'll take the vaccine apart. We'll just find the, the, the ingredients. So we looked at aluminum. We looked at squalene. And really to our surprise, and it really was a surprise, because we thought we were just going to eliminate that as a possibility. We started to see motor, motor behavior deficits very quickly. And those motor behavior deficits continued, uh, mostly with the aluminum, and then we took the animals, we sacrificed them, we did the brain histology, and we saw a lot of motor neuron death. And ever since then, we have, it's, it's like, I, mean, I guess the analogy I gave uh, earlier today was, it's like, you know, you have a loose thread on your sweater and you start pulling on it, where's it gonna go? You know, you're just pulling on it, and, and it just keeps unraveling, and keeps unraveling. And realized that aluminum was not as innocuous and inert as people were saying, that it did things that were not good in the nervous system. And we pursued that, and we kept, kept looking at that. We looked at it, we looked, in, uh, looked at the pediatric schedule of aluminum adjuvants. Uh, we tried to duplicate that and largely did, uh, and saw, saw behavioral uh, and other uh, functional deficits in the mice, and have carried on with their work ever since. So it's, it's me just being one of those annoying people who follows breadcrumbs through the forest and sees where they go, and that's what I've done to this day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'd like to bring on our moderator, Mr. Shelley Winter. <laughs> Shelley is a uh, local uh, talk radio host for 106.7 uh, FM here in Atlanta. And uh, the great thing about Shelley is that He's very new to um, the vaccine discussion. And so he really is, I was, when we were searching for a moderator, we wanted someone who's really middle of the road so that, um, you know, he didn't really fall to one side or the other. And so that's what Shelley is, is that he's really kind of, he has questions. So he's great and we're here tonight with him. So. Um, before we begin, before we get we uh, begin, I want to thank these ladies. I, I get approached all the time um, about moderating and doing events and stuff. And you meet, and then three weeks later you don't hear from anybody. And then a month later they call you out the blue and say, "We told you it was three months from now. Can you go and be on your way now?" And I met these two ladies um, at the behest of a friend from the Cobb County Republican Party, and um, we've been meeting. They've been sending me emails. I've never seen a more organized two women in my life. Um, and they're, they're very passionate, and um, so I'm glad you all are here on, on their behalf. Thank you all for coming, and thank you uh, panelists for coming, because these two women are very passionate about the subject. As they said, I have, <clears throat> I am, um, I am the, uh, I may not, I can tell by the applause, 
uh, that there's a, a side, I guess, if you will. Um, so I am kind of the guy in the room that represents kind of the other side, if you will. I'm going to be asking the questions that if you're, uh, I guess, pro, that's the question you would ask. I'm kind of representing these guys, for lack of a better word. Um, not an MD, not an expert, nothing like that, but I'm going to challenge them um, because I, I think it's important. And, and as, as the lady said, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't have a particular position. I'm learning. I'm new, new to this. The first time I saw Vax was I saw uh, Minister Farrakhan speak with Robert Kennedy at the Fox Theater. Um, and that's when, um, that's the first time I'd even heard of this subject. And I'm a news junkie, trust me. Um, so uh, please believe me and don't hate me at the end um, <laughs> because I need you all to listen to my show um, <laughs> on the new talk 106.7 every morning from 6 to 9 a.m. So uh, I don't want you to hate me at the end of this. But I am playing the role, if you will, of the, um, of the uh, kind of um, uh, skeptic, if you will. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And <laughs> I would like to say, as we are beginning, uh, again, please keep your phones down. Um, also, if you have any great questions, we want everybody to know and understand this is a safe space. We are all here to learn. So if you have a question that is going to challenge our panelists, we welcome you. We want you to please come up at the question and answer sections. And please, don't hold back. Give us all you got. And we welcome you. And, um, and challenge these guys here. Please do. They came up here for a reason. Let's give them a good reason to be here. Okay? <laughs> and lastly, uh, we'll have a great intermission um, after the first block. If you're hungry or have a drink, we will have a cash bar ready for you so you can have a little snack to tide you over, as well as there will be some products, uh, some books and things that you can purchase as well at the intermission. So thank you so much for being here. So I'll start with Mr. Uh, Dell Bigtree here. The, this is a huge topic, as we could see by the audience here, um, and we've all watched the video. I guess the basic first question for all of you, and I'll start with Dell, is are vaccines safe? I think that's what most parents want to know off the rip in the beginning. Are they safe? Well, I think that that should be, we should see the other side. I think we have a video to show how often we hear that in the news, which is where I work. So if we could see that video, and then I'll speak to it. The American Academy of Pediatrics reiterating today, vaccines are safe, effective, and save lives. Vaccines save millions of lives, and it's really safe for people to get them all at the same time. I understand people are, are scared about putting chemicals in their children. I totally understand mm -hmm. that, but they have been proven safe in study after study. Make clear your position, position of my dad, a pediatrician, get your kids immunized, it is the safest thing to do. Get them immunized and then do it on schedule. Children should get vaccinated against preventable and potentially deadly diseases, period. All right, so in television, you produce, you bring in these people and you discuss issues like that and you know what the, what the stance is, especially on the doctor's television show, vaccines are safe, vaccines are effective. Well, after making Vaxxed, I was asked as I traveled the country with that film, is it only the MMR vaccine? Because Vaxxed was only about one vaccine, one fraud, one cover up by the CDC and Dr. William Thompson. What about all the other vaccines? And I couldn't answer that. All I could tell you is as we traveled in a bus across the country, parents were coming up and blaming every single vaccine for either a death or an injury in their family. And I started recognizing it's more than just the MMR vaccine. So I think I'm one of the few journalists in the world that has done nothing but investigate vaccines and this idea of whether they're safe or not for three years. How do you do that? The way I learned to do that on the doctor's television show was to read medical journals. I read the studies. So when doctors say vaccines are safe, when Sanjay Gupta says vaccines are safe, my question was, where are those studies? I hear about the studies. I hear doctors say there's thousands of studies that prove they're safe. I started reading them, and I put together a nonprofit to read them, and I've worked with great people. But we had an amazing opportunity when Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was asked by Donald Trump to meet with the National Institute of Health about vaccine safety. 
Uh, we work together with a great team of lawyers and doctors and scientists to put together what issues we had with the vaccine program. We presented it at the NIH, which was heads of CDC, C, um, you know, AMA, all the, all the major luminaries of our, our health department, HHS, and we presented a PowerPoint. I'm going to just show you what I think are some of the, the most cogent points that we made. It started out just like this. What we said at the NIH was this. In 2017, a scientist named Peter Abe, a doctor who's responsible for promoting vaccines in the third world, he's one of our top doctors that promotes the use of vaccines to try and help third world health. One of the biggest issues we have when we talk about vaccines is we want to see a comparison study between vaccinated and unvaccinated. How do you say that vaccines are safe or that they're effective or that they're good for our health if we've never done a comparative study between children that get all their vaccines and those that get none? Without that comparative study, how do we know this is the best way to raise our kids? Well, Peter Abe recognized this question, and he was looking through all of his data and realized that he had a DTP vaccine program back in, the, uh, in, in 30 years ago that had, the way it had laid out between three and six month old covered the country, he said, we actually only vaccinated half the kids because of the age groups and how they'd get to the villages. So I actually have a perfect randomized study of vaccinated versus unvaccinated the DTP vaccine, he put out this paper in 2017 and what he discovered was shocking, that his program of DTP, the children who received DTP vaccine died at 10 times the rate, 10 times the amount of kids died that got the vaccine versus those that did not. And so he came to the conclusion that, and they did not die of diphtheria, tetanus, or pertussis, they died of other things like malaria, you know, other foodborne illnesses. And the conclusion was, as he wrote, all currently available evidence suggests that the DTP vaccine may kill more children from other causes than it saves from diphtheria, tetanus, or pertussis. The theory being somehow we're weakening the immune system and making them more vulnerable to other issues. My nonprofit is now pressuring UNICEF to stop using the DTP. After this study has come out, they're fighting back against that. We have no idea why. We have stopped using it for a very long time because it was so dangerous. We now use DTAP. But our question was this. If we only now know this year that DTP vaccine kills 10 times the amount of kids 30 years after the fact, how do we know that there's not a vaccine that's doing the same thing in this country? How do we know that the 16 vaccines that we're giving in 53 shots aren't somehow killing some kids, maybe at 10 times the rate, or a synergistic effect amongst those vaccines? What are our programs? Well, here's what we laid out. Here's where we're at in America right now. One in six children now has a developmental disability. This is not this is not, I don't recognize this as being the way we lived as kids. So ADD, ADHD, aut autism skyrocketing. Our special needs classes are exploding in schools. Next, 54% of American children now have a chronic illness, either a developmental disability or autoimmune disease. And when people ask me, why are you involved in this? I would say I wouldn't be here if we had this, the healthiest children in the world. If we had the healthiest you know, generation of children we've ever seen, the exact opposite is true. We have more babies dying on the first day of life in America than every other industrialized nation combined. Fact. You're 70% more likely to die before 18 in America than all the other richest nations in the world. Something's really going wrong here. And as a journalist, I feel like I'm responsible to look at it. Let's look at what we think may be happening. If you look at the vaccine schedule in 1986, we got 11 vaccines. So every grandparent parent says, well, I got my vaccines. I'm sticking with the program. You had a totally different program than your children are getting because now in 2017, we're giving 53 vaccines, 72 doses compared to the 11 we got before 1986. And if you look at the crisis of childhood illness, chronic illness, in that exact same time period, we've gone from 12.8% back in the 1980s to now 54% have a chronic illness. These are coterminous, they're moving exactly with each other. Yes, it may be anecdotal, but it's what we call a signal. And are we looking into it? Next slide, please. So if we go to the FDA website, it says that vaccines are safe. How we know, vaccines go rigorous and extensive testing to determine their safety and effectiveness. 
This is what the FDA says, says is happening. This is what I believed was happening when I worked on the doctor's television show. Certainly, we test these like crazy. Remember, we talk about fast-tracking drugs as though that might be advantageous. We know there's a danger to it. But those are for people that are dying of AIDS, that are dying of cancer, that are dying of major illnesses. Sure, they're willing to take the risk. But vaccines are given to perfectly healthy children. You would expect the rigors of that safety test to be even more robust since these children don't have a problem going on. There's no emergency. They're perfectly healthy. So let's look at it. Here's how drugs are tested. They go through what's called a double-blind, inert, placebo-based study. Lipitor, for instance, had a 4.8-year safety trial, meaning one group got the drug and the other group got a sugar pill painted to look just like the drug. It's called a double-blind experiment because neither the scientists involved in the study or the people that are in the study know which one they've got. And for 4.8 years, they take it, and then we graph it out on the computer, and we ask questions like, who has more cancer? Who has more mutagenic effects? Are there gene mutations? Is there autoimmune disease? And if the safety profile is roughly the same when we unmask it, then the drug gets approved. Look at Embril, same thing. 6.6 .6 years, this is an injection. So with this, they gave a saline injection, a totally inert substance that does nothing to the body. It ended up being as safe as the placebo. We move on. Now let's look at vaccines. This is the hepatitis B vaccine we give to day one old babies. As Bob Sears said, what is the point in a, this is a virus or this is a, this is a problem just like AIDS, okay? You are not gonna come in contact with hepatitis B unless you're sharing heroin needles or sleeping with prostitutes. So I don't know how you plan on raising your day one old babies, <laughs> but I don't see the rush for this vaccine, okay? Now when we look at the safety trials, I'm not making this up, folks four and five days respectively. Not four and five years, not four and five months, not four and five weeks, four and five days. Oh yeah, they're safe, kids look good, moving on. If they develop diabetes in a year, couldn't have been the vaccine because we never looked at it. If they get autism three years later, no way it was the vaccine. Our trials show that nothing happened in the first four days, so we know it's safe. We would never do this with a drug. And look at the placebo group. None. The scientific method was not used for the hepatitis B vaccine. There's only one way to establish safety in a medical product like this that goes into your body, and that's a double-blind inert placebo study not done for this vaccine. Take a look at polio. Polio vaccine, 48-hour trial review. This one actually did use a placebo. Look what they used. DTP vaccine. The vaccine we just discovered last year kills 10 times the amount of kids than those that don't receive it. And so the polio vaccine compared itself to one of the most dangerous vaccines we've seen. And we said, look at same safety profile. Let's approve it. Moving on. Next slide, please. So now we go to the Institute of Medicine. Obviously, the CDC, FDA, they don't seem to be doing their job very well because they're approving vaccines without the scientific method. Well, we have the Institute of Medicine. These are, this is the brain trust of science in America. Nobel laureates that sit in a private group outside of our government agencies. And every once in a while, the CDC asks them to do a, re a review, look into something that we're questioning. This is one of the reviews they did in 1991. They asked, look at the DTP vaccine. Would you please look at it? Because we have 22 common adverse events being reported by parents after this vaccine and people that receive this vaccine. So will you tell us if it's possible that the vaccine is causing these 22 common side effects? Well, they looked into it, and what they found was the literature, all the science, they looked at the science all the way around the world and said, you know what? We found studies that have shown that six of these issues are caused by the vaccine, that four of them definitely not caused by the vaccine, but the important number is 12. 12 of these issues, we have no idea, no science has ever been done. Aseptic meningitis, serious problem. Wouldn't we like to know, since parents are saying, my child got meningitis right after this vaccine, there should be a study, none exists. Same for neurologic damage, learning disabilities, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is paralysis. I mean, the list goes on and on. And they rebuked them. Give me the next slide right here. 
They rebuke them and say, look it, if research capacity and accomplishment in this field are not improved, future reviews of vaccine safety will be similarly handicapped. Do your job. Again, these are being given to perfectly healthy children. We can't leave these questions sitting out there. If these diseases are being caused, if these issues, these illnesses are caused by the vaccines, we have a problem. And just look at the number. I just thought about this the other day. Six of the 22 were positive for causing issues. Four not. So the, 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 the majority that they looked at were causing issues. They did this multiple years. I want to look at 2011. In 2011, they looked at it again. Now we're looking at varicella, tetanus, hepatitis B, and the MMR vaccine. Now we have 155 common injuries being reported by parents all over the world, especially in this country. 16 of them, they said, we looked at all the liter literature, 16 of these incidences are and can be caused by the vaccine. But five, definitely not. But look at this number, folks. Out of 155 common reported side effects, 134, they have no idea. Zero science has been done. Guess what's back in here? Guillain-Barre syndrome, meaning they never looked into it the first time they had that issue. They saw that people were reporting the problems, but they never did a study testing whether the vaccines were doing or not. They didn't care. They stuck their head in the ground. And look at these issues, encephalitis, encephalopathy, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, myelitis, transverse myelitis, this paralysis. That's technically what we would have called polio back in the day. This list is horrifying, and we have no idea whether vaccines cause or not. And what's even scarier is the godfather of our vaccine program, Stanley Plotkin, was asked about this. He was asked, and we said, you know, well, you have all of these issues that you don't know if the vaccines cause it. How do you say they're safe under these circumstances? And he says, where there's a lack of science, I assume safety. I assume safety. That's how our science is done. If we don't do it, we can tell you it's safe because our assumption is safety. Do you think they're inspired to do the studies we need them to do if they can say they're safe by not doing them? That's the problem we find ourselves with. Why does this matter? Here's why it matters. This is one, really the only reporting system we have for vaccine injuries in America. It's called VAERS, Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. When you have your child injected with the vaccine, if they have seizures a few hours later, the next day or two, you go back to your doctor and say, something went wrong, my child's having seizures, your doctor's supposed to report it to VAERS. If your child dies two days after a vaccine, your doctor's supposed to report it to VAERS. Now, we're told vaccines do not cause any problems. One in a million, one in a million has an injury, except in 2016 alone, in America alone, 59,117 reported injuries to VAERS. 432 people died from vaccine reported to VAERS. 10,000 emergency room visits reported to VAERS. I mean, look at that, 59,000. If an injury is one in a million, are there 59,000 million people living in America? There's something wrong with the math here, but it gets worse. Health and Human Services manages VAERS. They are the ones that control it. And they've done internal studies. They hired Harvard Medical School to look into VAERS and see how accurate is it, how many people use it, how many doctors are reporting to it. And what they discovered was fewer than 1% of adverse events are reported. That's from Health and Human Services saying it themselves. They say we don't trust VAERS because it's so underreported. FDA looked into it, found the same thing. A fraction of people or doctors ever report it. So what does that mean? Does it mean that it's possible that 5.9 million injuries took place in 2016 alone? Does 432 deaths turn into 43,000 deaths in one year from vaccines? 10,000 emergency room visits turns into a million. I'm not saying that. This is no way to do science. But what I'm telling you is, if Health and Human Services is right about their own program, this is in the ballpark of what we're talking about. Thank you. Before we go on to our, our, our next panelist, I, I want to ask you this, Del. So you said the DTP
vaccine is uh, 10 times the, as many deaths. How many, I guess the, the flip side to that question would be, how many deaths would there be if there weren't any DTP vaccine? Like, how many kids uh, would have died? One tenth the amount. I mean, look, I don't, the exact numbers of how many people actually die. You do have difficult living situations, you know, in, in Guinea Bissau, Africa, where this took place. But that's what's so incredible about it is that clearly 10 times the amount of kids were dying. So that's what we know. There's, there's other anomalies when they got the polio vaccine at the same time, it was only five times as deadly. So there's some synergy there that we should be looking into. But I guess my question is, if I'm, if I'm looking in a, um, uh, a sub-Saharan country with poverty, no sewage system, things right. like the things that lead to these kinds of problems, and 10 times the amount died with the vaccine, I'm wondering how many were can dying I, without it. Can I clarify this? Yeah. I, I was actually the one that broke that news a year okay. and a half ago cool. because cool. I've been in, I was in email contact with Peter Abe for the last several years. Mm -hmm. And what you don't understand, and what maybe he didn't make it clear, is that there were 10 times the amount of deaths for every one child saved by DP or T. Gotcha. You okay. see? So it's not like, oh, all these kids died. All these kids died for every one we might have saved. Gotcha. So it's definitely a mortality rate that's well and beyond what would have happened from the for one they might have saved from diphtheria, pertussis, or tetanus. Killed ten kids. Right, and Dr. Um, Pul Jacob Puliel in India had said the same thing. I've been in contact with him about their multivalent vaccine as well. That it was killing about five to ten times the amount of kids for everyone it might have been saving for the disease that were supposedly covered in those vaccines. So, so let me ask the question in, in, a, in a different manner: If you don't have the vaccine. Let's say there's no D DTP vaccine. You wipe it out. We 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 solve our problem. We don't do it anymore. How many kids are dying? I, can I talk do, you know, sure. do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like how many kids do I lose so the without it? So the, so the World Health Organization statistics say of children who have pertussis in third world countries, the death rate is about four percent. The death rate in in first world countries of children who have pertussis is less than zero point two percent. But still, 4% is really quite small. Because the reason that children die from pertussis is under the age of three months is because they have very small windpipes, they get exhausted, and they usually die of dehydration. And so they don't have third, first world care in third world countries. Gotcha. So third world countries of children who contract pertussis, death rate is about 4%. It's not 96%, right, it's right. not even 50%. Right. 4%, which is not to minimize the death of a child, but still 4%. In first world countries, it's less than 0.2%. Gotcha. Did you want to say anything? No, I was just oh, going to make oh, sure that, oh. Oh, I, I can just add something. Uh, we have a, I have a slide, but uh, you know, we, we don't have to go to it. We, we did uh, some looking at the CDC's own numbers. So from 1990 to 2018, the number of people who have died of pertussis in the United States is 345 from the disease. The number of people who have died according to VARES, and again, based on what Dill is saying, uh, Dill is saying is it's, it's probably vastly underreported, the 1,700. So the vaccine is, a, and th these are not my numbers, these are right. the CDCs and VARES, and the CDC controls VARES, uh, along with the FDA. So there's the, those are their numbers, not, not mine. Can you say that more clearly? Sure. 345 people died from the disease itself, from pertussis, between 1990 and 2018 in the United States. In the same period of time, VARES reports 1,700 fatalities from the DPT vaccine. And it could so. be 100 times greater. And yeah. if, you know, if, if it's vastly underreported, now, there are problems with the VARES data set of, of various kinds, but again, this is the CDC and the FDA's data set, and I'm on And this, you know, if it's underreported, the problem is maybe bigger than, than even that, even allowing, for un, even allowing for misreporting and allowing for uh, unverified reports. But, but so then, then let me ask this, because both of you focused on the pertussis, the P and the DDP. What about the D and the T? How many deaths from diphtheria, tetanus? Diphtheria is a negligible it's, disease yeah. in okay. any country of the world. Gotcha. And tetanus, um, the tetanus, the rate of tetanus isn't reported in third world countries. In first world countries, the last time they did one here in the U.S., there was 128 cases. And of those 128 cases, 60%, we didn't know what the vaccination rate was. And there were about 17 deaths. And the, the people in that data set, 16% uh, had four or more tetanus shots and still contracted tetanus anyways. So that sort of says, what does the tetanus vaccine actually do if you can have four or more shots, adequate antibodies, and still contract the illness? Yes. Um, I want to come to Dr. Sears. Sure. Yes, yes, sir. Um, 
What is your take on are vaccines safe? Thank you, Shelley. Um, I want to talk about, as a, as a practicing pediatrician, just kind of what the process is regarding trying to identify vaccine reactions and report them, and how pediatricians are, are instructed by the government and by our medical societies to try to investigate and recognize vaccine reactions, and how, you know, uh, sadly, our pediatric uh, um, medical community is, in my opinion, failing to recognize these vaccine reactions and report them. So. Um, there's really this huge uh, disconnect between all the science we're presenting and the science that the CDC has on vaccine reactions and what pediatricians really believe is happening. So much science shows all these reactions can and do happen and how commonly they happen, but if you ask 99% of pediatricians nationwide, they'll, they'll tell you these reactions never happen. They can happen, it's impossible. Severe reactions just don't happen. I don't believe it happens. So CDC and, and you know, the, you know, everyone doing research says one thing, pediatricians believe another thing, and, and I, I, I don't like that disconnect, and so part of what I try to do is try to bring to the forefront how these reactions happen, what they are, and how to recognize them. Um, so I'm gonna start, basically the, the, the first slide is the federal law that uh, shows doctors what they're supposed to do with informed consent for vaccination. We're supposed to give every parent information on the benefits and risks of vaccines. We're supposed to um, write down any serious health problems after vaccination into the child's medical record. And we're supposed to report any serious changes in a child's health after vaccination to VAERS. This is federal law. Now states actually let doctors off the hook. States don't mandate that doctors follow these federal laws but it is a federal law nonetheless, and it is a, definitely a safety guideline we're supposed to follow. So let's go to the, um, to, to the next slide. Um, let's see what vaccine manufacturers instruct doctors to do regarding counseling patients on vaccine safety. Again, you have to inform uh, the, the, about the benefits and the risk before vaccinating. You have to tell the patients about the, the possible reactions that have been reported in other patients, in other studies. Uh, reactions that are temporarily associated. We have to uh, uh, instruct them to, to report their reaction to us. I'm supposed to tell every patient, if you have a bad reaction or a moderate reaction, call us, let us know, bring your child back in, let me know so I can write it down. And we're supposed to give them the vaccine information statements from the CDC, which is a kind of a, a brief summary of the risks and benefits. Next slide. Um, these, this is a list from one vaccine, what those temporarily associated vaccine reactions are in, in the research. And we're supposed to inform patients, maybe, you know, I don't know, pick and choose 15 or 20 of these and make sure the patients know these things have been reported after this vaccine. And you can read these as easily as I can, but some of the, uh, some of the, the neurological side effects, depressed level of consciousness, encephalitis, which is brain swelling and inflammation, um, all kinds of, of bad reactions have been reported. The vaccine manufacturers instruct doctors to make sure you're telling patients about these and you're warning them about, about it. Next slide. Um, you are also, before you give any vaccine, you're supposed to ask the parent if there have been any reactions to previous vaccines. You're not supposed to just ask them once, you're supposed to ask them any time. Every time they get, they get the fourth or fifth dose of that vaccine, you're supposed to ask them, any bad reactions previously? Has your doctor ever asked you that sitting in the office? Raise your hand if, if you've ever been asked that. Uh, no, oh, well, okay, a couple, a couple of people in the back. Um, um, uh, okay, um, and then of course, report any, any uh, bad reactions. Um, go to the next slide. Sorry I have to use notes, you guys, uh, but this is uh, important information. Um, this is a, a small portion of the CDC vaccine information statement. This is what pa every patient is supposed to be given. This is just one section of it. You're supposed to be uh, informed about the risks. MMR vaccine. Your child has about a one in 3,000 chance of having a seizure from this vaccine. Um, you could have temporary uh, arthritis. It happens about one in four, uh, mostly teenage and adult women. Some of those women, those, some of those one in four women who have an arthritis reaction will go on to develop chronic lifelong arthritis. You can, uh, you can have bleeding problems uh, from a low platelet count, one in 30,000. Um, serious problems, fortunately, they're very rare, allergic reactions. 
but they, you know, they, they say the MMR can cause deafness, long-term seizures, coma, lowered consciousness, permanent, permanent brain damage. The CDC says this. Pediatricians say, no, they can't. Pediatricians said, no. Vaccines can't do this. CDC says yes. The vaccine manufacturers say yes. So there's, there's again, that huge disconnect. Go to the, the next slide. Um, <clears throat> There's a section in the, in the VIS forms called, what if, there, what if there's a moderate or severe reaction? I want to read this to you because I didn't know about this until about uh, two months ago. And I was surprised. I thought I knew, I knew it all. It says, for patients, what should I look for? Any unusual condition after this vaccine, such as high fever, weakness, or behavior changes. Um, you're supposed to look for behavior changes in your child after MMR vaccine. You ever heard of a child uh, suffering uh, behavior changes after vaccination? Uh, I have. A lot of you have in the audience. The VIS form instructs you to tell your doctor. Call your doctor. Tell your doctor what happened and the date and time it happened. Ask your doctor to write it down and report it to VAERS. You go to your pediatrician and tell them what the CDC warned you about just happened. The doctor will say, sorry, I don't believe it. It's a it's coincidence. Toddlers just do that. Caesars just sometimes happen, it's unrelated to the vaccine. That is the pediatric mindset. But it's not the mindset of, of science and the researchers. Okay, go on. Uh, oh, I, I wanna uh, actually um, uh, go back two slides to the, the MMR. I wanna point out, this is a, an, old, uh, an old version of the MMR VIS. You know it's missing from the VIS forms now in the MMR if you look at the new versions? The one in 3,000 doses and the one in four, and the one in 30,000, they took the numbers off of these VIS consent forms. I think parents are concerned if they read something that says, my kid's gonna have a one in 3,000 chance of having a seizure from this vaccine, but in the United States, they have a zero chance of dying from measles, mumps, or rubella. Parents might get concerned that the numbers might suggest, I'm not saying they do, but they might suggest that the vaccine poses more risk than the diseases. Again, I don't know, I'm just saying what this used to say and what it now it doesn't say. You okay, go on to, uh, to where we were. Um, because these, these VIS forms, in my opinion, the, the changes in what they're showing and, and how pediatricians are ignoring these, they get worse. This is the DTAP vaccine. This is a newer, uh, Shelley, the newer, possibly safer version of that DTP vaccine we were talking about earlier. Um, Again, uh, you're supposed to inform patients uh, you could have a one in about 14,000 risk of seizure. Nonstop crying for three or more hours uh, occurs in up to about one in 1,000 children. The reason that's highlighted is that's a symptom of encephalitis. Uh, in the medical community, we know that if a child has nonstop uh, inconsolable crying for three or more hours after vaccination, that means their brain is swelling and it's inflamed. That's a symptom of encephalitis. Some of these kids will go on to have encephalopathy, which means their brain was damaged by that swelling, okay? Um, one in a thousand chance. Serious problems are very rare. You know, again, the, the, these mimic the MMR warnings, uh, permanent brain damage, uh, comas. Um, now, um, uh, let's see. Okay, if you look at the DTAP uh, form now, and it warns you about these reactions, guess what's, guess what's gone? The numbers. They've taken the, the one in 1,000, they've taken the one in 14,000 and one in 16,000, they take the numbers out of these, and I'll show you that later. Um, go to the next slide. There's another section in the DTAP VIS form, it's called, some children should not get this vaccine, or should not get a second or third dose, you should stop. Let me highlight. If a child cried nonstop for three or more hours after a dose of DTaP, they should not get this vaccine again. Um, guess what's not in the new version of the uh, DTaP warning as of six weeks ago? That very warning. Because that's the most common statistic they have on their VAS. VAS, one in a thousand babies were suffering encephalitis symptoms. They took the, that statistic off and they took it off the section uh, um, about, uh, you know, to warn doctors and patients that if this happened, don't get the shot again because you might be putting your child at risk. Now, what if there's a serious reaction to the DTaP vaccine? Again, like the MMR vaccine, it says, look for severe allergic reactions, very high fever, or behavior changes. The child suffers behavior changes from this vaccine. 
that could be a potentially serious reaction. That's in the serious reaction section, behavior changes. Sounds so benign, right? But when we see behavior changes after vaccination, we worry about how the brain is handling this vaccine. Well, guess what's, uh, go to the next slide. This is the new version of the DTaP vaccine under what, is, what if there's a serious problem? Where's behavior changes? They took it off six weeks ago. Prior to six weeks ago, they warned every patient, look out for behavior changes, because that's a sign of a serious problem. They just took it off. And I, I think uh, in today's world, we want transparency. We want informed consent. And when the CDC starts taking specific important facts off, then, uh, then I think it does a disservice. I, I feel like it essentially takes the reality out of these risks. If we take away the numbers, you don't know how likely it is your kid to have a seizure, then you feel comfortable it's more likely to, to not happen, right? Because you don't know how likely it is. It kind of takes the reality out of that. Um, go on. Um, now, what do the vaccine manufacturers have under their section? What to watch out for? A warning to not get this vaccine again? There it is, persistent and inconsolable crying for three or more hours. The vaccine manufacturers warn us that that's a, that's a huge uh, warning sign. And the CDC uh, just took it off the section. They took off the one in a thousand and they took it off the section that informs you that it's a warning sign. Um, they, they still have it there as a possible reaction, but just not in the warning section. So um, go, uh, go one more. Um, Oh, yeah, that's the last slide. So, so doctors, again, they're, they're trained that all these warnings don't happen, so doctors don't even give you this information anymore. They're not required to give this, to you, give this information to you under state laws. Federal law requires it again, but state laws don't require it. So they don't have to give you any informed consent for vaccination. The CDC tells them to, and the, uh, the um, federal law tells them to. And... What concerns me uh, as a final note is, is how patients are treated when a reaction does happen. The doctor doesn't write it down, doesn't report it, the patient might report it. Um, and so if, if you have a terrible reaction and you, and you don't see that doctor anymore and you try to explain this to another doctor, your new doctor will say, well, let me see the medical records. Well, why didn't your doctor ever write down there was a seizure? Why didn't your doctor, doctor write down any of these problems? It's just they're just not documenting it. So what, what, let, me, let me close with, um, we're talking a lot about vaccine safety and vaccine side effects and reactions that get, can or, or can't happen and what the science shows. Um, most people, shall we say, that vaccines are, are so, they're so good. They, 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 you know, they save lives, vaccines are safe, vaccines are effective, vaccines save lives. I, I have a question though, what if it was true that given all these reactions that vaccines might actually be making you less healthy. And I, I don't know, I'm not saying they do, I'm saying what if? And what if there's research that looked at that? And should we have research that looks at if, if families don't vaccinate, are they actually healthier by avoiding all these reactions and, and risking the diseases? Or are they, are they more healthy if they fully vaccinate on the CDC schedule? That's what I think science needs to look at. I'm gonna show you just a few quick studies. Um, uh, this is, this, this is one study, and you can go to the next slide too. Uh, um, if you're watching at home, you can pause and, and look this up. But these were two studies in Europe that essentially looked at families that were following a complete natural lifestyle, a totally natural approach to life, which included not vaccinating. And they actually looked at some of those families in the same lifestyle that were vaccinating. And they found those that were not vaccinating had a much lower chance of uh, allergic disorders, like eczema and asthma. And, and they actually looked at specifically families that got MMR vaccine versus families that did not get MMR vaccine. Those that did not get the MMR vaccine had much less asthma and eczema and other allergic disorders. There seemed to be something about the vaccinating families that made them at, at more of a risk of allergic disorders. Now, do allergies sound that bad? On, on the surface, it might sound, might sound like a minor problem, just take an allergy med. But, Kids with chronic eczema, kids with chronic asthma, that really sucks. And, and so I think we need to look at the science and decide, it, it, are there circumstances in which it might be safer to raise your kids in a healthy manner versus, uh, versus you know, a natural, natural approach to life, 
versus not, and we need better science to look at this, to answer this question for us. And then the final study, which is kind of the only, the only large, or not even large, the only vaccinated versus unvaccinated study of its kind in the United States so far, looks at about, a four, about 400 vaccinated kids and 260 unvaccinated kids across four states in America, and they, they looked at what their health outcomes were. Who had more diseases? Who had more um, chronic medical problems? Go to the next slide. Vaccinated kids were 30 more times to suffer from nasal allergies. Vaccinated kids were four times more likely to suffer from ear infections, six more times to have pneumonia, six more times more likely to have pneumonia. ADHD and learning disorders were four to five times more likely in the vaccinated group. Um, ASD was four times more common in, this, in the vaccinated group. And when they looked at preemies, 32% of vaccinated preemies developed a neuro, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, whereas none of the unvaccinated preemies in the study developed a neurodevelopmental disorder. Now, this is a pilot study. We can't draw any conclusions from this study because it's too small. The problem is no one will do this study. No one will do this study. No one will do a large-scale study. The government told the CDC to do the study like five, six years ago, the CD said, no, no thanks, we can't do the study. So now the government is trying to get the NIH to do the study, and hopefully they will someday, because we have to know if it's true about unvaccinated kids. Um, and uh, anyway, I think, I'll, I think I'll end there. I think, again, you know, as a pediatrician, we've got to do a lot better about, about identifying, warning, giving informed consent, like federal law mandates, we do this. And uh, so that we can, you know, provide better health care to our children. Thank you. So, so Dr. Sears, um, I have a couple questions. Okay, the first one you you had mentioned the M MMR vaccine. There's no death rate. There's no one's dying of these diseases anymore. Is it possible that no one's dying from these diseases anymore because of the vaccines that have been given over the last 25, 30 years? Sure. I would say that for that particular vaccine, that might be partially possible, that, that the vaccine is reducing the, the cases of diseases. And I know some of my colleagues might, might, to, might not agree with that, but most vaccines, uh, well, no, we'll say that for later, but you might have a valid point, but in America, with, with good access to healthcare, good nutrition, other treatment options, great medical care, uh, you know, where kids here don't die of measles. Kids don't die of mumps, they don't die of rubella. Gotcha. Um, the other question is, parents are watching here, parents are here in the audience, and parents are watching on, on a live stream. Um, when you're going through what they get from the doctor, what are some of the questions, you know, one or two questions that the parents should ask when they get the sheet and it doesn't have the numbers on it, it doesn't have the information on it, and they're just getting a sheet. They're there, they're thinking, you know, my kid has to get vaccinated. They get the sheet, probably half of them, probably more than half of them, stick it in their bag, don't read it. What are some of the questions that you would say to everyone listening that's a parent or a new parent, going to be a parent? What are two questions they have to ask that doctor when they are in that office? Thanks, Charlie. Well, I would say the most important thing is you shouldn't be waiting until you're sitting in your doctor's office uh, to ask these questions, right? Good point. Good point. Um, you know, the, the doctor has done your checkup, the doctor's left the room, the nurse comes in, hands you these information sheets and says, I'll be right back with your vaccines. Gotcha. That's how it's done and that's not okay. Gotcha. Um, and uh, the, uh, the vax versus unvax, I know it's a study, I know it's new and everything like that, but is it possible, because I'm thinking, if I'm an unvax family, everything about my family is going to be healthier, I think, Food, diet, exercise is going to be healthier than a vaxxed family. I'm going to, the vax family, I'm going to assume, is going to give a lot of Doritos, going to pass, you know, the, the, you know the, a, a lot of junk food just to get the kid through the day. But the, vac, the unvaxxed family, from, starting from the outset, is a healthier lifestyle at the, at, the, at the outset. Do you think that could be a play in why they're um, healthier kids in, in the unvaxxed? Because the, the family's going to be a healthier living family um, off, the, off the top. Right. Um, I, I'm going to ask if any of the other researchers, uh, Dr. Shaw, if anybody knows this study, if they, if they allowed for that factor in this study. 
or if they did not allow for that factor. I think they've considered it, but I don't think they've, they've actually yeah, done that. So your, your, your point, your, your point, Julie, is really good. Right. I mean, it, it could be a lot of lifestyle things that contribute to that. I'm thinking of an unvaxxed family, uh, probably I, vegans. I, I, they're they're I, I eating no processed that. food. Yeah, and I, 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 want, I want to say one thing. You hit on exactly at the NIH meeting that Bobby Kennedy, that we had with CDC, FDA, everyone sitting there. When we said, we want, you have to do a vax versus unvax study, they actually said, I can't forget if it was Tony Fauci or, or Francis Collins said, we can't do that study because we already know how it's gonna turn out. There's an advantage to the lifestyle of people who do not vaccinate. Now, I want so, you to think about what that means that though. Means for those, <laughs> yeah, for yeah. those For those families that are not vaccinating, meaning we don't care that you're raising your kids and they're gonna be extremely healthy and brilliant right. and eating organic food because it is a lifestyle, we're gonna poison you because right. we have got to care about yeah. the Dorito eating, Coca Cola right. drinking right. families of America. Right. right. And, e and, even, and even more so than that, um, I'll take moderator privilege here, um, but even more so than that, it's even more dangerous because there are families who are forced by their economic, socioeconomic positions to eat with the Doritos Absolutely. and the Coca Cola. So you're, an even, you're not even encouraging, encouraging them to eat healthy and live right. healthier lifestyles, you're just poisoning the kids. Right. Absolutely. That. One is that it's a free form. I believe that the that the va that many times in vaccinated families it leads to this false sense of security. Yeah. My kids are vaccinated, so I don't have to worry about keeping them healthy. You know, the kids that are unvaccinated, yes, it is a lifestyle. But I think that parents come to that decision about not vaccinating because they're concerned. And so they want to do the things that they want to do to try to keep the kids healthy. The vaccinated set of population, oh, they're vaccinated, they're not going to get the flu, they're not going to, I don't have to worry about that. One other really common is one of the things that Bob was saying about those numbers being taken off the VIZ statements. If it really was one in a thousand, there are four million live births per year in this country. That means 4,000 kids per year. And, and anyone suffering, and suffering. Suffering, suffering from encephalitis. And those kids get get five of those shots, two, four, so six months a year. Chances, you have so. five chances, so the number may be even greater than right. that. And so you're rolling the dice with your... Yeah, yeah exactly. But the other thing to talk about the junk food eating families is that there might be some evidence to suggest that babies that are breastfed and where um, the family, the mother's healthy, and the, the family eats healthy food, that those children also are less susceptible to injury if they do get vaccinated. I'm not saying that they should, but that, f that children who don't have good nutritional support, who might already have some chronic inflammation because they're eating junk food, which causes uh, oxidative damage and inflammation for many, many reasons, and that they actually are more susceptible to vaccine injury and to illness as well. I mean, not just to illness, but to vaccine injury as well. So there, there could be other things at play that also make it even worse for those kinds of families who do vaccinate and have this false sense of security and let their kids just run amok with junk food. And yeah. some don't have a choice. Absolutely, I, I understand that. Um, do you guys mind if I go back a little and ask a question? Um, Dell, you were talking earlier. I, I want to get something straight here, because I never thought of this till you were talking there. So studies are done. So I have diabetes. Let's say I have diabetes. I have type 3, whatever the number is. And the doctor knows, the doctor knows I have diabetes, and I get him one of these studies. They know I'm sick. They know I'm sick of diabetes, from diabetes. So they give me a placebo knowing that I'm sick, and they give someone else with diabetes a real medicine that they want to put on the market, right, drug, and, drug. and I go through it, and they just let me just go through it, no? It doesn't work like, so in okay. drug studies, where they take people who have known diseases, they have to, they usually te test the new drug against the current treatment for that disease. Okay. So, so it they, works I a little bit. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. If, you're, if say, you're in a study for a known disease yeah. that already has a treatment, they, the, ethically, they have to give you. Okay, I was yeah. going to say. They it's, test it against the, the previous or the, the current treatment. Kind of sounds like the Tuskegee the original, experiment. The original, but it doesn't, I mean, I think this is a good point. It still has to track back the original, back to the original source, something has to have been against an inert a placebo and to have established that. the baseline. Right. And what we're seeing in vaccines is we they're, they're testing against vaccine upon vaccine upon vaccine, <laughs> and there is not a single vaccine being used that no, has ever been through the placebo and, to establish And we're all going to bring that up and right. get into that, but, the, yeah. but to his specific yeah. question, it is that is just not how drug studies yeah, are I, done I just to make if sure. there's already a current treatment to a disease gotcha. and you're in the... Um, another question is, uh, when I watch commercials on television, um, I used to sell advertising, and when, when medicinal and pharmaceuticals 
were allowed to advertise on television. There's a long-standing rule that they weren't allowed to advertise on television because the government didn't want pharmaceuticals pushing medicine. Then they dropped the law. That's why we have these disclaimers at the end. And, and the guy's talking really, really fast, and you have no idea what he's saying. Um, but there's side effects to every single one of these medicines. Um, but yet we all take them. You know, I listened to a commercial and met foreign, and they say you might not be able to, you know, love your wife the same anymore, but I, I take metforum. And stupid as me, and my wife's mad at me for it, but, you know, I, I, I do take it. There's a side effect that I know there's a side effect. With vaccines, we know there's a side effect. Is this a part and parcel of being healthy, so the side effect, and accepting the side effect? Shelly, that's an interesting point, and I'm going to be talking about that. But oh, okay. remember, you're talking about people who have an issue who are looking to fix an issue, okay. quote unquote, get treated for an issue. That's not the case with somebody getting it's a vaccine. A We're starting with somebody without an issue, right? So usually, if you break a leg and your femur's sticking out, you take the risk on having the surgery because you, you're not going to hang around like that, right? Gotcha. Or if you're bleeding, well, I mean, you know, you right. wouldn't if you have the choice. And if you're bleeding and your hemoglobin's low, you get the blood transfusion. You take risk to get better. This right. is not, that's not that's applicable okay. to getting vaccinated. I a, I, that and, makes and total to, sense. To your point about the advertising, if you rarely watch commercials now, because that was the way, one of the things that the, um, the government said, okay, you can advertise your drug, but you have to say the disclaimer of all the things right. that are on. Watch a vaccine ad. They don't have, they don't have it. They're considered yeah. public because they're considered um, what do you call it? Public, uh, public, public, public service public. announcements. Right. Not, not they. That's how they get away with it. They they qualify as a public service announcement. So HPV that I see with the kid, the teenage boy. I wish you, my you'd have known, mommy. There are no disclaimers at the end of that. No, and it's usually not the manufacturer okay, doing I don't it. Represent it's, the side the money anymore. might come from them ultimately, but it's. <laughs> I'm done with this side. I'm over. I won't finish. Slide over here. <laughs> yeah, that's it. This is nuts. This really is nuts. I'm sorry. This is nuts. I can see. I can see why. I can honestly see why, and I apologize. I'll get back to the questions, but I can see why they don't want to um, uh, uh, debate in the same space. I can, honest to God, see why that is. Um, and it's not the numbers, it's not anything else, it's, um, it's, a, it's a lack of fundamental common sense that I can't see, you know? Uh, just listening, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I can understand. I, I debate all the time, and if the people I debated lacked a basic common knowledge, I guess, and not a talking point, it'd be harder to have that debate, and I can understand why they wouldn't want to if their talking points are always knocked down. It's a, this is fascinating. Thanks for inviting me, ladies. <laughs> um, so, Dr. Bark, yes. Dr. Bark, Dr. Tony Bark, yes. um, can you tell us, uh, I've heard, I had Dell on my show, I had the ladies on my show, autism came up, um, and vaccines causing autism. Um, can you talk some more about that? Absolutely. And if, it, if they do, then does that answer the question, are vaccines safe? Clearly, no, if they do cause Well, this is one specific aspect of it. Do you have a video on that? I think we had a video. Did we have a video? I don't know. Do we? Yeah. Roll yeah. the video. Okay. We'll do the video on that. After this. We're not sure as a scientific community what causes autism, but we know that vaccines do not. Vaccines are really the one thing we have looked at yeah, as not, causing autism. Yeah, I agree with you. We know that vaccines don't cause autism. The science is clear. There was no association between prenatal and infant exposure vaccines that contain therm uh, ther thermosal and increased risk for autism. Vaccines don't cause autism. They are highly effective and safe. You can never really say MMR doesn't cause autism, but frankly, when you get in front of the media, you better get used to saying it, because otherwise people hear a door being left open when a door shouldn't be left open. Right. So, okay, so you know, you heard, I, I love this, because Sanjay Gupta said, we don't know what causes autism, but we know vaccines don't cause autism. Okay, so think about that. If we don't have a clue, and I left out my potty mouth before clue. If we don't have a clue, um, then how do we know vaccines don't contribute, right? So there is something called attributable risk, because what Sanjay is saying is that 
Vaccines contribute nothing to the cause of autism. That is a zero attributable risk. You cannot attribute the risk of autism to vaccination. Okay, that's what he's saying. And then in the social sciences and the health sciences and in statistics for these things, we use this term attributable risk. And attributable risk has a verbal definition and a mathematical definition, which is just the equivalent of the verbs, of, of, the, of the grammar in mathematics. And so this is the um, definition of attributable risk, which is basically saying, you know, what did, how much did being exposed to fill it in, whatever, this, you know, an earthquake or a, a loss or a vaccine, how much did that contribute to paralysis or crying or, or autism, right? That, that is what we want to find out in attributable risk. The mathematical equation looks like this. So it, you can see in the mathematical equation very clearly that the incidence in the unexposed appears very, you know, very clearly, right? The incidence in the unexposed is part of this mathematical equation. So this is a mathematical equation. It's the only definition of attributable risk across the board. That definition cannot be changed. So in order to, for Sanjay to say, and I'm on a first name <coughs> basis with him. No, I'm not really, but you know, I'd <laughs> like to say that. So um, in order for Sanjay to say that there is zero attributable risk from vaccination to autism, that means he's confident that he's looked at the rates of autism in the completely unvaccinated population of children or adults, right? Except he hasn't, because where has he, he found that? We've seen some kind of bogus design studies on the MMR and on thimerosal, right? But we have never seen studies on all the other vaccines or the whole schedule relative to unvaccinated children. Right? And you've already heard, and you're going to hear again from, from more speakers, that the vaccines are not tested against inert placebos. They're tested against other vaccines or adjuvants. But now they're mostly tested about other, uh, towards, against other vaccines. Okay? Um, so we don't even test vaccines against un unvaccinated children because all the children in these studies get vaccinated. So we don't have this information, right? And Dr. Gupta is not stupid. I don't know about the rest of the crew that we saw. I'm not so sure. But I don't think that he's stupid, which makes you kind of have, I don't know, come to a, a realization that he might know what he's saying and know that he's not telling the truth. I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for him. But I don't believe that he's stupid. I believe that Dr. Gupta knows he's gone through med school. Anybody who's gone through medical school has had statistics. If you've done a master's in any health or medical science, you've done statistics, you've learned attributable risk and the definition. So doctors, and I don't believe doctors, most doctors are lying. I believe most doctors actually believe what they say. Um, but they're not thinking back to med school. They're not thinking back to that statistics course that they needed in college and medical school, by the way. We had to take it twice, because it's a prereq. So they're not thinking back to what they learned, which is, you can't make that statement unless you've looked at the unexposed. And if you're not looking, you're not gonna find. It's as simple as, I mean, this is basic common sense. This is not even high-level statistics. Like, high-level statistics is over my head. This is not considered high-level statistics. This is really basic stuff. But I want you to all understand that because when people say, we know X, Y, Z doesn't cause this, you have to say, okay, show me the study. And I'll tell you that um, um, there's a, a doctor who's an oncologist who wrote the, um, the malady, can't, oh, malady of, do you know what I'm talking about? Malady, okay. And, yes. The, the king of all mal the malady, king of all maladies. And he's an oncologist and he writes for the New York Times and he is very well known, he's a beautiful speaker, he's actually a beautiful writer. But in the New York Times he wrote an article and he threw out there that there's no evidence cell phone cause, uh, cell phone radiation can lead to brain tumors. And he just, and he said that's been refuted um, and just like, just like the vaccines causing autism. 
Okay, he threw that out there. So I wrote to him. I wrote to him, Siddhartha, his name is Siddhartha. Siddhartha, you know, I'm, I think you're a beautiful writer. You know, I'm a big fan of your writing, which is true. Um, the King of All Melodies, that's the book. Anyway, I said, you know, in the New York Times article, you threw out there just like the link between vaccines and autism have been, has been disputed. And can you, I said, I'm, I'm in grad school doing my master's in disaster medical management, I'm an MD, and I can't find any of those studies that you could be talking about the attributable risk of vaccines to autism. Could you please guide me and send me those studies? And he emailed me back and he said, oh gee, uh, you know, I only found this one study on MMR. Um, I, I, and I wrote back and I said, but you said vaccines don't cause autism, so you must have looked at all vaccines and you must have looked at that relative to unvaccinated children. And he wrote back and he said, you know, I, I don't have a reference. And I said, well, are you going to write something in the New York Times Magazine, you know, to say that like as an editor, as a note? And he said, no, I'm not. And I said, well, you, you know, you, people look to you as a, as a physician, an oncologist, a science writer. You, you threw it out there as though it was fact. I assumed you had a reference. Most people would assume you have a reference. I believe that you owe that to the readers. And he said, no, if you want to, you could write a letter to the editor. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff. This is a really intelligent guy who's a beautiful writer. And he's a trained oncologist. And he realized after I called him on it that he didn't have the right to throw that language out to say, well, we know the link. There's no link. Vaccines don't cause autism. We've already seen that and tested that. He realized after I pointed it out that he didn't have the reference and the reference hadn't even been done. The citation of the study hadn't been done for him to make that statement. But he just made that statement because it is a belief that is so ingrained that most doctors say it as though it's fact, and it's really a factoid. And that's a word I made up. It's a factoid. <laughs> you know, really, I like that word. It just, it's a factoid. You know, it's not really a fact, but people believe it's a fact and they don't question it. So that's what it is. And that's what we're up against, right? So we have a lot of problems with our safety studies. You know, vaccines, I, I do a lot of work in the courtroom, and I have to go through meticulously two, three hours of testimony, and I have, and I'm not gonna show you because it's literally 80 something pages, but for each vaccine, and to, and to Shelley's questions on, but is it safer to get the vaccine? Even if there's a risk, is it safer? And that's a very valid question. And the answer turns out to be no. And if you want this document, I've already circulated it, I, I, I don't have a problem showing it. It's just that it's 80 something pages and each vaccine I go through, and for each country I've had to do this in, we go through the notifiable disease rates of, of all these infections that we, that we vaccinate for, because they're really infections, right? So we go through the notifiable rates and we look at how many kids, what's the risk of any, actually getting this infection, period? And then if you get the infection, what's your risk of having a long-term sequela, right? So if you get mumps and you're 10 years old, what's the long-term risk? Pertussis, everybody eventually gets. I don't care how many doses of that vaccine you've had. Eventually, you get pertussis. That, that is just reality. That's what I see. That's what I saw in, my, in the ER when I ran the ER. That's what I saw in the urgent care. That's what I see in my practice. I see teenagers coming to me with chronic coughs and we swab them as pertussis. They've had five doses, right? So, but what's the long-term sequela? It's a big pain in the ass to have pertussis when you're in high school and college, which is what we're seeing now in vaccinated kids, as opposed to at four, five, six, and seven, and they miss a week to two weeks of grade school. It's really not a big deal for them, right? So some of these vaccines have reduced some of these things that we're seeing, right? Measles vaccine has definitely reduced the rate of measles, but at what price? At what price? Yes, we have less measles. I do not deny that that vaccine has reduced measles rates, but what is the price we're paying? The price is high, okay? The price is very high because of the injury to the vaccine and the side effects and the transmission. So what happens is that you get a live viral vaccine. And by the way, in the last eight years, the only two cases of measles I've seen have been from teenagers who were forced to get the vaccine 
because they were getting their green card or they were green card and getting turning, you know, getting their citizenship. And that's a requirement. Vaccines are a requirement for citizenship. So I have two teenagers who were fine. They get the vaccine, and, with, and you know, within a week, they've got measles. So those were the only cases of measles. Of course, they were fine. I gave them vitamin A. But the point is that vaccine, <laughs> the point is that, you know, that, that vaccine, along with other live viral vaccines, cause shedding, right? And if you have some benefit, some protection from the vaccine, um, whether you're shedding months later or you're shedding right away, which you don't even know you're shedding, so you're out in public. So it's actually the vaccinated that often walk around shedding live virus, not the unvaccinated, because unvaccinated, you get sick with an infection and you stay home, you feel sick, right? You stay home, you're more likely to stay home. Okay, so that's, that's one thing on, on that vaccine. And it, we've gone through this with each shot. You know, what are the side effects? What's the risk? You have a 4% chance of diarrhea. You have a 16% chance of ear infection. You have a 12% risk of seizure. You know, there's, you add up all these risks and you look at what's, what's been the death rate from these diseases in these countries, right? And so every country has a, an amount of children who are not vaccinated. And it varies. And in this country, it's anywhere from 3 to 10%, depending on what you're counting as unvaccinated. Okay, but so there's ways of actually looking at these numbers and looking at the risk benefit. And is the, if it's riskier to get the shot, then it doesn't really make sense to get it. The other thing is we've, you have to keep getting the shot because as we now know, none of these are one-time lifetime immunity. Like, they, like the bill of, of, of goods we were sold when I was a kid when they came out with some of these shots. Measles was lifetime immunity, it's not. So what has that done in terms of safety for newborns and elderly? It has shifted the burden of the disease from these normal ages that we evolved over millennia getting these infections to now newborns. And the reason that is, is that mothers, you know, mothers that are now having babies in their 20s and 30s did not Get, they were not allowed, like I was, to have mumps, measles, rubella, chicken pox. They have unnatural immunity to it. So they have some antibodies, maybe. A lot of times they wane. But even if they have antibodies when they're pregnant, the antibodies don't last as long. And so the transplacental antibodies given to the fetus don't last as long. And now for the first time in the last several years, we've been seeing infants susceptible to things that they never were susceptible to before, before the age of like a year, right? Now we have infants under a year that are susceptible to diseases and to infections that they would have never been susceptible to. They would have been a year, year and a half before they were susceptible to them. And that was a normal time frame for, the, for them to get it. And we're seeing adults whose immunity, or at least antibodies, so-called immunity, partial immunity, have waned. And now they're at risk at an older age, which whether it's more problematic for them is one thing, but certainly if they're in college, grad school, working in a job, it's a much bigger hassle to be sick and stay home with a fever for a 10-day period before you're you know, your rash is gone and you're no longer infectious. You know, so this is a problem. And if we admit, and I was taught as a pediatrician that with every dose of a vaccine, there is a risk. There's always a risk. There's a risk of death. There's a risk of encephalitis. We have a table of injuries in the vaccine court that says there's a risk of these things. Guillain-Barre, that's why it's so interesting, the Institute of Medicine, the Institute of Medicine saying we're not sure about these other things, except a lot of those things are actually on the table of injuries like Guillain-Barre and transverse myelitis. So those are the no-fault claims, right? Those are the ones we don't have to get expert testimony. You get a vaccine, you get Guillain-Barre, it's on that table of injuries. You don't have to get an expert testimony for that in the court because it's accepted. And yet the IOM now is saying, well, we don't have the studies. We're going to say it's neither here nor there. So there's a a lot of these things raise more questions for me because we don't, we don't have the studies that we need. The few that have been done, of course, if they show anything negative towards vaccine safety, they, the author gets beat up, they, the paper gets retracted <laughs> if it's printed. This is what's going on now. 
So this is the issues that I see with safety is that we can't, we can't say we have a huge grasp on the safety because we don't really have the safety studies. And I'm just going to finish up by saying that the Cochrane collaboration, which had been until very recently a very respected collaboration because it really kept itself away from governments and in industry money. Um, when I say governments, I mean regulatory agencies like the CDC. Um, so until then, so many times my shirt is open, I don't know what I'm getting told. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Whew. Anyway. <laughs> Um, the Cochrane collaboration at the end of each meta-analysis of all these vaccines states very clearly, we need safety studies, we don't have them. So if you don't have a safety study, a true safety study with a placebo, looking at the unvaccinated, looking at the untainted, we really can't make a risk-benefit assessment. And if we're denying the risks and not, and not having doctors even report them into VERS, which they don't do. Most doctors don't even know what VERS is. And I know this from hearing other expert testimony on the other side. Um, then we really don't know the risk. We don't know the safety. Can't really make a risk benefit assessment that makes, that's ingrained in any kind of solid ground. So. So, um, Getting close to our intermission part, um, and I don't want to cut anybody short or anything like that, but um, if we can um, kind of pay closer attention to time. Wonderful job, Dr. Barr. Well, Dell set the stage. Okay, all right, so we're gonna, six minutes. We're, we're gonna blame so Dell then. Del I, I, I agree with you, because <laughs> Dell is, is, you're totally more beautiful than Dell, so <laughs> we, we will blame Dell for everything. Um, um, so you, the answer to the question basically is um, it, it, uh, vaccines do cause autism. Is that the answer? Absolutely. The bottom so line va answer. Vaccines are one of the contributors to autism so, because gotcha. it's chronic. Well, there's, you didn't say what it is, but yes, yeah. absolutely vaccines can cause autism. Gotcha. Um, just can't. Can. You can. can. They can. They can. They, can. they, can. they don't necessarily. No, gotcha. but they can and other things can too. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Shaw, yes. you had mentioned earlier uh, uh, in your introduction, you're uh, aluminum, that you're the aluminum guy. Um, if, can you actually, tell- Chris actually is the aluminum <laughs> guy, I'm just kind of the junior aluminum guy. Yeah. Junior aluminum guy. Um, can, you, can you talk to us about the tie between um, the use of aluminum in vaccines, which, you know, uh, again, I, I'm no scientist, I'm just a simple working talk radio host, but I. Why do we even have aluminum okay. in vaccines? Oh, all right, there we go. Mm -hmm. So, are you ready? Are you really running out of time? No, no. We, we okay. Don't. okay. If you're running out of time, I can give you a, a two-word statement: aluminum in your boat, in your in your car and airplanes is good. Aluminum in your body is bad, and we'll tell you about why. Um, we don't have a laser pointer, so you're going to have to pretend. So, you know, as I start off saying, um, we primarily study uh, ALS. We have, have historically, we have a zebrafish model, believe it or not, you can study something like ALS, motor neuron degeneration in a zebrafish. I won't go into the reasons why, but you know, that's one of the things we do. And we've been playing this molecule a lot in the last little while because it seems to, in an, again, an animal model that's created by another toxin, not aluminum, seems to actually prevent um, motor neuron loss. Go to the next slide here. Um, yeah, and it's called, it's copper, called copper ATSM, and it's basically a copper chaperone. It puts copper back in mitochondria that are damaged. And if you do that, next slide, please, you basically, and the, you know, the key one to look at is actually this one, where you see that the toxin here is in the orange, and it is knocking down your, mo your motor neuron numbers very significantly, and if you put this compound in, it puts it back where it's supposed to be back in control levels. So this is a very important compound. Nobody seems to be particularly interested in my field, which is kind of a shame because it does seem to have a therapeutic <laughs> advantage, but well, that's another discussion about NIH and funding agencies. Go to the next slide, please. And the other thing we've been following, again, this is our ALS uh, PDC cluster. It, you know, the, the, the people on Guam would make, they would harvest the seeds of the cycad tree, they would grind it up, they'd make tortillas, and that's re really tightly linked to the em emergence of the disease. So some sort of toxic factor, they never found a, a genetic factor that was, that was clearly a, a, a dominant factor on, on Guam, uh, but they did find these, these various toxins, and one of the ones that was considered was aluminum. Next slide, please. Okay, so one thing to know about aluminum, aluminum is very common. So I was having tea earlier today, 
And if Paul Offit were here, he would say, you know, there's more aluminum in that glass of tea than in your, you know, than in, and you get in a vaccine. And that's true. We, we live in what uh, Chris Axley, who's, a, you know, again, a well-known uh, aluminum biochemist, has said, this is the age of aluminum. It's in everything. It's in probably most of the stuff we have in our pockets. It's in, you know, in our boats and in airplanes. Uh, but it's also in all kinds of medicines, and it's also in vaccines. So we are surrounded by aluminum, but that's not historically and geologically always the case. Life on Earth originated, see, aluminum just got him. Um, <laughs> life on Earth originated without aluminum. Aluminum is normally tightly complexed in things like bauxite. It tightly binds to silicates and other things, and actually silicates are one way to get it out of your body. Um, and so over most of evolution, we find that almost nothing on Earth, and there's a, there are a couple of examples where, th where some plants actually use aluminum, not for uh, anything besides shunting other things away that are, that are harmful as well, but nothing else uses aluminum. We have evolved without evolution. As Chris actually says, uh, aluminum has been selected out of evolution. Okay. So when it gets into a biological system, biological systems spend a lot of energy getting rid of it. Because it's, it's not good. And so when you actually give it, you're, you're, you're heading for some sort of problem with this molecule that is not inert. It's extremely reactive with every other, uh, every other element that's essential for life, such as carbon, such as, such as sulfur, such as you know, you just, you, you have phosphorus, et cetera. And so when you, when you put aluminum into stuff, you're just going to break stuff. And that's pretty much what we see happening. So we, this is our first study. This was the one I did with Mike Petrick. You look at behavioral things, you look at things called leg extension and the gait length. These are messed up completely when you inject aluminum into, into your you know, two-month-old rat. rat uh, uh, these are mice, sorry. And when you look at the other behavioral tests, they're falling off on everything. In, 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 uh, in memory, they're falling off in uh, a water, when a water maze tests uh, spatial learning, and, and they're completely falling off. And when you actually look inside the brain, I think, forget that, we'll go to the next slide, please. And that's the, that was the study. Next one. And you know, aluminum uh, adjuvants have been used for you know, since '76, a lot a long time, based on the fact that they were they were looking at I think they were looking at I can't remember which which uh, disease they were looking at. It might have been diphtheria, and they couldn't actually get the the the, uh, the, uh, the vaccine to work. So they started rummaging around on the chemical cabinets, and they came up with aluminum hydroxide. And I think the rationale was, oh well, we use it in pickles. It wasn't a hydroxide, but it was the aluminum potassium sulfate. And you can still go buy aluminum potassium sulfate in, in the store for pickling. So if it's good for pickles, how bad can it be in, in your body? Well, the answer, as we'll see in the next slide, is pretty bad. Um, this has been known for a long time. This is a, a paper by William Gies way back over 100 years ago for a sentence uh, where they were recognizing that aluminum uh, could be toxic. And again, it only started to be refined. The age of aluminum only really began with the extraction of aluminum from bauxite in the 1880s. Um, so again, this was recognized a very long ago. Next slide, please. And here's what the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia says, or said uh, previously. This is the, the vaccine division. And the first uh, sentence, I think they've taken this down since then. Aluminum is considered to be an essential element. OK, not exactly true. And they, they, they go on with all well, the reasons why they think that that's true. <laughs> And by the same logic, of course, bisphenol A and flame retardant and all the other things we have floating on our bodies that our grandparents didn't have would probably be good for you too, and natural, part of the natural evolution of children. Next slide. And then they actually then, actually, believe it or not, I, I hope they have taken this down, but they actually quote this paper by P.O. Ganrot in 1986 to support their idea that aluminum is actually okay. And you have to read the first sentence of that paper, which is, 79, 78 pages, 959 references, and this is the first, the first uh, paragraph. Aluminum is present in very small amounts in living organisms, but is abundant in the environment. In no case has alumina, have aluminum ions been shown to have a definite biological function, et cetera. So that is just a, a complete manipulation of the literature to prove something else, which is the opposite of what Ganrod actually said. So, um, again, I won't, I won't go into uh, the, the, the Mitkus paper right now. We can talk about that later. Go on, next one, please. <coughs> next. Okay, so here's, here's our first real detailed study of aluminum injection in young mice. Um, this was, again, trying to duplicate Gulf War syndrome. And this is aluminum hydroxide being injected. They very rapidly lost uh, uh, their ability to hold on to stuff, so they were losing motor function. 
They changed their behavior and how they moved through an open field. And late in the study, they began to lose cognitive function when, when you were looking at their ability to lo localize themselves in a water maze. But it gets worse. Next slide, please. These are slides on the left are normal motor neurons sta uh, stained with something called uh, neurojade. It identifies motor neurons in the spinal cord. These are ones on the right that are in the aluminum injected animals. The red and only on the aluminum side are dying motor neurons. Okay, and so the actual number of motor neurons that have died are quite considerably higher. And again, it's a busy slide, and I wish I had a slide, uh, a laser pointer to show you. But aluminum is killing cell, killing motor neurons in these animals in both the spinal cord and the motor cortex, very much like an ALS. Next, please. And if you actually go and stain for aluminum, you discover your motor neurons in the aluminum only, in the aluminum and squalene group actually have the motor neurons are loaded with aluminum. So, uh, very, very clear results there. Go on, please. Um, my colleague, Lucia Timlenovich, who is no longer in the field, but was working in it for a long time, actually wrote a really, really great paper on this. She was revisiting the idea that aluminum might be involved in Alzheimer's disease. And that idea had come, come up in the, in the 80s, people, and made people afraid of cookware. But that cookware is not really the problem. So she went back and looked at the whole literature and she made these tables, table after table. Where are you getting your aluminum from? You're getting it from, in some cases, your food, in some places from water, because they use aluminum as a flocculant to knock down particles in, in a lot of drinking water throughout North America. It comes in cosmetics. Go back, please. It comes up in cosmetics, and of course it comes up in vaccines. The argument that's made is that aluminum is such a small amount, therefore, and that was the Mitka study and the, and the, and the quote by Paul Offit, but the fact is that aluminum kinetics in the body are very, very different if you eat the aluminum or if you inject it. The, 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 the pharmacokinetics are absolutely different. If you eat it, you mostly, if you, have, if, if you have patent kidney function, and that's what most adults do through most of their lives. When you're very young, your, your kidneys are not mature. When you're older, your kidneys are less functional. But most of your life, your kidneys are excreting most of your aluminum comes out in, in urine, it comes out in feces, it comes out in sweat, you get rid of almost all of it. When you inject it, that's not true. And a whole series of studies, go to the next, next, next slide, please. Okay, this, this, this table just goes on. Uh, Tom Lenovich went on and on and on about all the things that happen in the brain. One more, please. And another, you know, again, anyone who wants this can have this. Go on. Again, you know, it gets, it gets you know, pretty ex extensive. Go on, please. Okay. So when you, when you inject it, it has a whole different pharmacokinetics. And basically, the Girardi group in Paris did a series of, of very extensive studies that said, well, if we inject it into a muscle, where does it actually go? So they actually know, because they, can, they had tracers. They had, they, they had uh, fluorescent tracers. They could actually see where it went. And what we discover is that it shows up in, it, it goes from the muscle, it goes into draining lymphatics, it's carried by macrophages, macrophages carry it around, and they finally park it in the brain and it doesn't seem to come out. This is a problem because aluminum, again, has no, no, no beneficial biological role in any system on Earth. Maybe on different planets, but not here. And so when you park it in your brain, all you can do is havoc. You're gonna create those kinds, of, those kinds of damages that you do see in Alzheimer's disease, and they're links that go back quite a long time, some work by Mike Strong and others in the ALS field who are actually looking at aluminum in Alzheimer's disease. And they found aluminum associated, tightly associated with tau protein. Tau is one of the, the abnormally phosphorylated tau is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And an interesting story, Mike, Mike Strong said when he, when he would give these talks and he would show the aluminum bound to the tau protein, that you know, people would come up to him later and say, you know, you really better not talk about that. And he actually told me that one time when I was giving a talk. He said, you know, you might just want to shut up about that. Because, you know, there are forces there that really don't want that, that information out there. So he and others got warned. Um, there was another fellow who worked on the, the Guamanian disease, saw the same thing. He was also told to shut up. So since we are kind of obnoxious, we didn't. And then we did that study, the one in the middle, do aluminum adjuvants contribute to the rising pre prevalence of autism. It was asked as a question. Again, we didn't necessarily expect anything to come of it. And then we found that, in fact, there was a, a tight correlation. We subjected that correlation because, you know, uh, people like David Gorski and others say, well, dum-dums, you don't know the difference between correlation and causation. Well, we kind of do. And the, the difference is, 
it, you know, it, 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 you know, sure, you know, it, the 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 number of the number of autism cases seems to go up, and so does the, the organic food consumption. But one of the things that you, you you use when you look at this this kind of stuff is is the AV Hill criteria. The Hill criteria are nine different ways of evaluating data to see if there's any possibility that the correlation is actually real, and hence might lead to the uh, conclusion of causality, or if it's spurious. And so there are nine of them, and we satisfied eight in that paper. So that didn't end the discussion. It didn't tell us that aluminum is causing autism. It said there's more things to look at. And it's, it le lends support to the idea that that now validates going forward in doing more invasive studies in an animal model, or however you want to do it, to actually look at whether there is any possibility that aluminum in vaccines, or anything, is contributing to neurological disease. And we then followed it up with a study of administration of aluminum to neonatal mice, where we simply took mice in the very you know, first couple of weeks of life, uh, with all the caveats that go with animal experiments and trying to compare mice to humans, and we recognize what those are, and gave them the vaccine equivalent doses of aluminum over a span of a couple of weeks to, to as, as closely as we, we could mimic the, uh, the vaccine schedule in young humans. And we found that they were behaviorally fairly messed up. Uh, some of those features, we've done that again. Some of those features go away over time. Some of them don't. Uh, and we're, again, re reproducing that whole, a whole, um, that whole discussion. And so one of the discussions with, with aluminum is people are saying, well, is aluminum the main driver of various, various disorders, various neurological disorders, including autism? And I don't think it is the only driver, as, as Tony suggested, but I think, it, I think it contributes, whether it's a primary or secondary um, con contribution, I don't know. But I think that's why more research needs to be done. Aluminum is definitely harmful in biological systems. It definitely contributes to, um, to cellular uh, destruction. It is not a fast toxin. It, you know, there were some studies on what's called dialysis-associated encephalopathy many years ago where they were basically giving people uh, dialysis fluid that was contaminated by aluminum. And very rapidly, when the, in the course of sometimes days to weeks, they would go to almost a full-blown dementia. When they stopped doing that, when they realized the problem, they stopped doing that, and that disease essentially vanished. So we know aluminum can do that. The aluminum we're getting, whether it's in an injection or in a glass of tea, is very small, and it's, it is not high enough in, in dose to give you a very fast reaction. But the, the, the linkage to autoimmune conditions, the linkage to brain inflammation, is very, very clear, and it's coming out of the groups uh, in Tel Aviv, Yehuda Schoenfeld's groups, the group in Paris, Roman Gerardi's groups, uh, Chris Exley's group in Britain, our work here. So all, the only way to get away from the conclusion that aluminum is potentially a toxin that has a role in various neurological diseases is to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. In the case of Schoenfeld, they say Asia doesn't exist. It's, it's a myth. In the case of ma macrophagic myofasciitis in the Gerardi group, it's a myth. It doesn't exist. In our case, it doesn't exist. In the case of Exley, it doesn't exist, etc. And that's the only, the only way out, because aluminum is, is a problem. And I think other people will, will discuss this. I think uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lyons Weiler will be talking about aluminum a little bit later. And it, 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 is, it is definitely a problem in a whole range of neurological diseases. But we need to do more work, not less. And that's kind of where I'm, I stand on it. Yeah. What, what? The, uh, man, you guys really are doctors. I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you need to see them. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? You guys, because you guys are really, really smart. <laughs> the, the, so the, the, the quick, what we call it in, in radio, the quick, you know, sound bite, why do they put it there? If we know all of that, just the quick, the quick, why is it there? It goes back to pickles. It goes back to? Pickles. Pickles. <coughs> Be, because the assumption has been that it is safe. And it is, I, I, various people in WHO and CDC have basically said, we are going to assume aluminum is safe and therefore essentially grandfather it without ever checking. But, but, but it's, it's a purpose, yeah, yeah. it's not a purpose. And the, and the reason, why did they do it? Yeah. Because a vaccine that uses a, a part of the protective antigen, part of a coat protein of a virus or a bacteria, is in itself not very antigenic, and it will not generate. Not very, I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Not very antigenic. It will not generate a prolonged ant ant antibody response. Gotcha. The aluminum 
is like a kick, well, I won't say that. It's, it's like a boot <laughs> to the butt. It really gets the immune system going. The immune system gets all bothered and it starts looking for stuff to do. And you got the antigen, and say, oh, that's, that's what I'm going to go get. Gotcha. If you don't put that in, your, your immunity wanes very rapidly. And that's why Glennie, back in 1926, and his crowd, and they were at Burroughs, Burroughs Welcome, that's why they started messing with stuff. They were trying all kinds of stuff. They, they were emptying the, the, the chemical cabinets. And they hit aluminum. And the, the various aluminum salts, they work. They really do. Gotcha. Now, are there other alternatives? Yes, there are. Gotcha. We can talk about that later. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a dilemma. <laughs> they need the aluminum there to help the vaccines work better. Yeah. And now they're kind of stuck, because yeah. they made the assumption it's safe without ever studying it. Yeah. Now, many researchers all over the world are studying it and finding out how toxic, toxic it is, like, uh, like Chris. And now the, the vaccine industry is stuck. They don't yeah. know what to do, so they're, they're largely ignoring. Yeah. Um, so so are the, the government thing. agencies, though. I want to point and out that academics. we need our government agencies to step up. But look at the danger they're in. They've been promoting these vaccines now for, like they'll say, 100 years. Yep. And they've been promoting them with aluminum, saying, we did all the safety studies for you guys. You have to know that they're safe. CDC, HHS, we're all behind this. What do they do now that science like Dr. Chris Shaw is doing all over the world is showing the exact opposite is true? How does our government now step up and say, uh, actually, we didn't do our homework and we've been poisoning you. What's going to happen to the confidence of American consumers and specifically of our minutes. medical issue? This is it's a serious problem and it's why I think government agencies are still just trying to ignore it now and hope that it goes away. They're going to hope they can force, you know, yeah. So we, you know, I do these vaccine injured and death cases and we have had an absolute impossible time getting a neuropathologist who's willing to do, so X, Chris Exley, who we keep referring to, did some very interesting work on brains, on autopsies, on, on brain pathology, showing aluminum in the brain. And it's not easy to do, and he's got a protocol. He can't, he, he no longer can do that, or he can't do it on these cases that are suing the federal government for deaths in our country, right? Because we've contacted him, he can't do it. So I not literally, well, I not spent well. a year trying to find neuropathologists who would be willing. We even said, we'll set you up uh, separate from the, act, from the institution you're in. They can't do it in an academic institution. The medical department won't let them. They can't do it at a separate institution that might be funded by federal government. Federal government won't have, have it. So here we have babies dying from vaccination. It's dependent on them winning in court to be able to show that the brain has aluminum in it. And I can't find anybody in the, in the United States to do it. And, and not only is the government in a predicament, it's the so is every single physician's office. Yeah, across and the academic that has been institutions. saying forever, convincing their patients, ignoring the viz statement, saying it doesn't happen, none of these reactions. And if suddenly they they had to look at it and say the government says it's not safe, now what are they going to do? They're going to left be left holding the bag. It's uh, it's interesting, um, and uh, I'm going to please don't get mad at me, but I'm going to be a little political here, but. I'm a conservative simply because I don't trust the government. So um, I just, you know. so you guys, you guys are just kind of formulating, strengthening my conviction <laughs> for whom I'm going to vote for coming up in the uh, midterms. Um, Dr. Tenpenny, yep. can you wrap us up in this block um, with the idea of uh, vaccination safety? Yep. Or uh, apparently, after the last hour, there is none. That's, that's what I'm hearing. That's it. Let's go, let's go to the let's bar, right? Home. Let's go to the bar. Okay. I'm safer getting drunk and driving home than it is. <laughs> well, just walking down the, that hill is probably dangerous <coughs> after that. So I'm going to put together just kind of quickly, it just sort of summarize everything, everything that we're talking about here. So of course we've determined over the last um, hour and, and some minutes that the whole issue, are vaccines safe? Because you hear it in every time that you hear it on the radio, on the television, in every magazine ad, in every uh, article, published article that you read, it's, it always starts out with vaccines are safe and effective and are the most important tool ever de developed for saving humanity like on the planet. I mean, it always like starts pretty much with that. And I think that we've pretty well driven the vaccine safety issue into the ground. That the next time you hear that mantra, which is just a mantra, it's just dogma. And dogma means it's something that's told over and over again under the assumption that it's true. That the next time you hear vaccines are safe, your whole world is going to come up to a different answer. 
And I want to just sum up quickly so, sort of the summary of everything that we've all talked about here. And I've identified five points that I think summarize a lot of what we've talked about here uh, across the board. Next slide. But before we do that, I want to show you, which kind of goes along with what Chris was talking about, about how we've added more and more aluminum. And back in 2000, um, Dr. Stephanie Cave actually sat down and, and added up the number of, the amount of mercury that a, a child could get on a given vaccination day, and it was like 87.5 micrograms. And that started the whole thing of where they, st suddenly people were going, whoa, mercury, all this mercury in vaccines on any given day? We know what the EPA standards are and what started the congressional hearings and what started them to pull the mercury out of the vaccines. And even though they never said, uh, issued a product recall and said, hey, all you vaccines out there, mercury, throw them in the trash, start over. They said, well, as they get injected by attrition, the next round will do less with mercury. So I said, well, if that's true about mercury, how much other stuff are we injecting? Because I consider vaccines being injected into children and adults nothing more than an injection of a wad of foreign matter. So how much foreign matter are we injecting? Well, this sort of looks, kind of, kind of spreads it out here a little bit. And I wish I had a pointer too. So yeah, so. Next go. Well, I can't, it's too little down there. I can't really see it. So here what we're talking about from birth until, from birth until one, year, one year of age, you, children receive 19 shots, 95 antigens. Now, what is an antigen? Antigen is either a virus or a part of a bacteria, which are foreign proteins that turn the system on against foreign proteins. By the, and they get 25 micrograms of mercury and almost 5,000 micrograms of aluminum. That's by one year of age. Now, between one year and five years of age, we add in 14 more shots. 34 more antigens, so now children by the time they start kindergarten will have had 33 vaccines. And if you look up there at the top where it says rotavirus, it says zero, that's because that's an oral vaccine, it's not a shot. So that's why it's not included in the math. So by, five, by the time they start kindergarten, they will have had 35 shots, 129 foreign pro particles and antigens, 125 micrograms of mercury, and nearly 7,000 micrograms of aluminum. Now, if you keep going and you get all the additional flu shots, meningitis shots, Gardasil shots, uh, uh, Tdap boosters, and meningitis B, by the time you've gotten every single thing, so you've done a good job, you've got your kids fully vaccinated from birth until 18 years of age, and these numbers are probably worth remembering. 54 vax shots, 208 antigens, 500 micrograms of mercury, and almost 12,000 micrograms of aluminum. And it's so important, one of the most important things I, I took away from what Chris was talking about in his talk is how much different uh, um, ingested aluminum is and how it behaves in your body from injected aluminum that gets taken up by the white blood cells and quite possibly deposited in the brain. Are you wondering why these kids have ADD, ADHD, you know, anger issues, why they're all put on Haldol and antidepressants and they want to beat everybody up and we've got gun issues in schools? Now couple that with bad food, glyphosate, you know, all these different things that are happening, violent video games, I mean, whatever else you want to put into their polluted brains that started up there when they were at birth and 19 vaccines by the time they were one year of age. So just that, and looking at that, whether you're a physician, a non-physician, a parent, anybody, how can you possibly say that's safe? How can you possibly even, in your wildest hair imagination, go, yeah, no problem, next slide. Because, and this, this sort of sums it down, 54 vaccines and the 208 antigens, next slide. <clears throat> so this is the rest of the story. These are the other p five parts that I think are worth talking about, and it sort of sums up what we've been talking about up here. Not safe number one is that vaccine studies violate the basic standard of research. There is no double-blind placebo-controlled studies for safety. Now that's what Dell was talking about. We were talking about drug studies, and you had questions about drug studies. But when you do vaccines, the, 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 the trial group gets a vaccine, the control group is supposed to get a placebo that by both the CDC and the NIH, criteria of definition of placebo is something that's completely inert, will not affect the biosystem, and will have no effect on outcome. But what actually happens is that you put a new vaccine out to trial, what the control group is, is almost always another vaccine 
except in the Gardasil trials, they got a shot of aluminum. That was the placebo. Now, granted, I admit I haven't, written every, uh, haven't read every single study article out there, but I know that those of us that have looked around, because it will say in a package insert, or will say in a research trial, or it will say in a, in a published article, placebo. Sometimes you can't find what the placebo is, right? I mean, we're looking around to see what it is, and, and you have to dig through FDA papers and all those sort of things to find what it is. And almost always, it turns out to be meningitis C, another, another type of vaccine. Well, it gets worse than that. In 2008, in a safety study, now, now we're ta not talking about efficacy studies. We're not talking about if it makes an antibody. We're not talking about if you get this vaccine and it keeps you from getting sick. We're talking about, is this vaccine safe? Are you going to have a seizure? Are you going to have some other side effect from it? And the only way you're going to know that is if in the control group by the double-blind placebo-controlled study of the standards, gold standards of research is to compare it to something that's inert. In 2008, that organization, the International Ethical Guidelines of Epidemiological Studies in association with the World Health Organization, they said, well, maybe if somebody's going to go through getting a shot and they're in that control group, maybe, maybe we should give them something called an effective intervention, which means another vaccine. Because if they're going to have to go through the shots and be studied and all that stuff, maybe we should give them something that's, you know, they get some sort of a benefit from it. But in 2016 now, the new standards have become that the World Health Research Guidelines have declared that study participants in the control group must receive an established effective intervention, means another vaccine. And it, hopefully they try to make it comparable. So if you're bringing a new hepatitis B vaccine to market, well, we'll just use Energix B because somewhere down the line we declared that that vaccine was safe and effective, so we'll just put it over there. And if the side effects are the same, then it's as safe as the placebo. So now even if you get good researchers who say, I really want to use like a truly inert subject, the new guidelines say that an approved vaccine must be used as a placebo. So that's the not safe number one so that they are violating. And if you talk to physicians or researchers who all hang their hat on being scientists, which I think is laughable, you know, to call a physician a scientist, I, that's my personal opinion, I think it's laughable. And they, if they say, well, you know, we, we follow the double, you know, and you say to them the, the, that vaccines do not follow the gold standard of research that in a clinical trial for safety, a placebo is not used, I think it's like their head kind of goes it's like an eggshell, it just cracks. It's like because they just, it just like so totally causes such complete cognitive dissonance in the way that they think that they really can't believe it. But that may be the seed that you've planted to make them say, that can't be true. And all they have to do is pick up one study and then another and another and another and they show that it really isn't there. Second, next slide. So not safe number two is the fact that when they do a clinical trial and they're looking for safety, they only enroll healthy children. So you'll read a study that will say, in this trial, 850 completely healthy children were, at, were, were enrolled in this style in trial. And the people with like sickle cell and cardiovascular disease and neurological problems and autoimmune things were screened out. So when they do this new study, only healthy children are included in the study. But what does that mean when that vaccine is approved? It, the pediatricians say that this new vaccine is really great. It keeps you from getting pneumonia or whatever. And they give it to everyone, even though the children who they recommend it for who are chronically ill have never, ever been tested as part of the clinical trials. So it is not, so that becomes the next level of experimentation. They call it, um, they call it stage four clinical trials. Stage one, stage two, stage three is when they can kind of bring it to market. Stage four is when they release it out on everybody and then find out if it kills anybody like all the drugs that get pulled off the market. So not safe number two is that the only healthy children are enrolled. Next slide. St not safe number three is that as they have the, these 850 kids in this clinical trial, that they will start to drop out. Not all 100 and 850 that were enrolled are going to complete the study. Some are going to, let's say, 50 drop out because they have side effects. Then they get the second shot and another 50 drop out because they have side effects or they just stop showing up or it's inconvenient or for whatever reason. Then they get the third shot because it's usually a three, three shot series in the trial because that's just what happens. And another 50 dropped out. 
So now you've gone from 850 initial enrollees down to 700. The, the data is, is, is then self-selected and they look at what was the outcome on those 700. And they may make some notes over here about these 150 they dropped out because they had symptoms and four of them died. But then somewhere in the bottom end of the study they will say, the study investigators have determined that the deaths had, were not related to the vaccine at all. Dismissed with the stroke of a pen because they said so. Nobody goes back and like relooks at that data and say, did those four kids die from those vaccines? No, it's like those study investigators are God and that's what they said. So set not safe number three is that the, the, the data is skewed towards safety because the negative side effects are just sort of listed over here but not really in the conclusions of the, of the, of the analysis. And anything that was left out, it was just eliminated by the stroke of a pen. Next slide. So not safe number four is that vaccines, as you saw from that initial slide up there, um, those were just dosages. Um, and part of my boot camp course that we just completed, I've got the best students and some of them are here. They actually came to, to come from our class. And they're all working on this project for me now that we're actually doing a really big project to look how much foreign matter are we really injecting that includes those 80 different chemicals. So we created the spreadsheet that there's 66 vaccines across the top and every single vaccine chemical and ingredient and cell line and everything is down the left hand side. And they're going through every one of the package inserts meticulously, and they're pulling out the actual quantity of each one of those ingredients, and we're listing them all as micrograms. Because when you look at the package inserts, some will be nanograms, picograms, milligrams, and so it's really kind of hard to add it all up, except we're doing this on an Excel spreadsheet. So when we have everything there in micrograms, we'll just be able to total up the sum amount of foreign matter being injected into our kids and ourselves. So of those 80 different chemicals, there are MSDS sheets on every one of them, mass, which are material safety data sheets that look at all sorts of toxicities and everything. Now the impact of all of those chemicals on the immune system and the synergistic toxicity effect has never been studied. We know a little bit about aluminum and mercury kind of being together. We know a little bit about aluminum by itself or a little bit about polysorbate 80 that punches holes in the, in the blood brain barrier because now they're using polysorbate 80 in chemotherapy trials for drugs that are used to treat brain cancer. They're coupling it with polysorbate 80 because polysorbate 80 punches holes in the, in the blood brain barrier so the chemotherapy drug can get into the brain to treat the brain cancer. Well, polysorbate 80 is in at least seven or eight different vaccines, and so when they punch those holes in there and that aluminum is in the neighborhood, it gets a, a steady ride right into the brain. So not safe number four is that none of those individual toxicities have ever been tested for safety. We, have, we don't have antibodies to see if there's antibodies to 2-phenoxyethanol or beta-propriolactone or any of the other chemicals that are injected, and we have no synergistic toxicity testing at all, none. We have a schedule that we give on time fully to every child in a one size fits all. We don't pre-test them for underlying mitochondrial dysfunctions. It's one of the only areas of medicine that we completely ignore family history or si sibling toxicity. And we have no, no testing on the toxicity of the, of the chemicals at all. Next slide. And, and then finally, not safe number five, is that every single package insert says that the product has not ever been tested for carcinogenicity, meaning does it cause cancer? Mutagenicity, does it break up your genes? Teratogenicity, does it break up your genes and then cause abnormalities in your developing organs? Or any long-term effects on fertility, not of, 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 or fertility in males or females? Now that we're now injecting flu shots and pertussis vaccines into pregnant women, we don't know if it's causing can cancer, messing up genes, causing organ problems, or having any long-term effect on the fertility of not only the person receiving the vaccine's mom, but on what's gonna happen to the baby. In 2004, I was at, the, um, at a CDC conference. It was the first international neonatal vaccination confer conference in Washington, D.C. And that was in 2004 when they were starting to really talk about all the vaccines that they were gonna be given to pregnant women. 
And the person sitting on the stage says, we're never going to get the OBGYNs to do this, never, ever, ever, unless we put the fetus onto the injury compensation program. Because we know these vaccines are going to cause all kinds of problems, and we're not going to know what we're going to sort out or whatever. But what happened is as soon as they started issuing those vaccines in 2008, 9, 12, 14, the obstetricians just rolled over and started hammering, the, giving, those moms pregnant, giving those moms vaccines. Now, even with pertussis vaccines, you're supposed to get one every single pregnancy. Even if you have a, uh, what do they call it, Irish twins, when you have two babies in the same year, mom gets two pertussis vaccines, even though none of those things have ever been proven. So to summarize that, we know that there's no placebos. We only give to healthy children. We skew the data to the side of safety just by randomly taking out those deaths and saying it had nothing to do with the vaccines. There's been no synergistic toxicity testing, and we've never had any of the ingredients in any of the vaccines. So the kids now get multiple doses of 16 vaccines. Not one of them has ever been tested to see if they cause cancer. How dare they say, how dare they say, vaccines are safe and one size fits all for every single child, adolescent, and adult is safe in something and safe and necessary in something that we should do. Thank you. Thank you. We're, uh, we're, we're at that part of our show where I know, uh, as you can see, I have a weak bladder, so I had to go to the bathroom. And, and, I, and that's probably because of my sugar cube vaccine I got 20. <laughs> many years ago. But uh, all joking aside, we're at that part where we're going to have a short intermission. But before we do, are there any questions from the audience? If you have a question on any part, here's the microphone. If you could walk up to the microphone. I would like to ask um, Dr. Uh, uh, Penny, uh, Tennyson. <laughs> ten tennis. Ten, ten. <laughs> yeah. um, ten uh, cents, money, penny, you know, ten I get penny. into it all. I'd like to ask Dr. <laughs> uh, ten Penny. Um, why? OK. So. I'm a woman, I get pregnant, I'm gonna have a child. You're gonna give a vaccine to my child right when he comes out, right, or she comes out, then you're gonna give some more, and over the course of the first couple months, they're gonna get up to a number of vaccines, right? What is the purpose of giving a pregnant woman a vaccine, knowing that you're gonna give a vaccine to the child when it comes out? Well, that's a really good question. The two shots that they're currently giving to pregnant women are influenza, because ostensibly they claim that pregnant women, if they catch the flu, have a higher incidence of being sick, hospitalized, and miscarriages. So you're going to give me the flu in order to stop me from getting the flu while I'm pregnant? Kind of. And then the same thing, and then the same thing with pertussis is that if, they could do, if the mom can develop antibodies that can pass through to the baby, so when the baby's born they have an antibody on board because the highest risk time in, preg in, in infancy for contracting pertussis is between zero and three months of age. That's when they have the sickest and the highest risk of a bad outcome. Sure. And so they're like, well, if we can get those antibodies on board before they are of the age that we can start vaccinating them, that may perhaps they will protect them. This last week, there was an article that came out that said that pr women who are getting uh, pertussis vaccines while they're pregnant are sensitizing the babies so that by the time the babies are born, and they really don't have an, a good antibody level, and by the time they get their two months old shots for their pertussis, they don't respond at, at all. So not only are they taking, so with those two months pertussis vaccines are all risk and no benefit, you take on all the side, potential side effects and get no benefit from the vaccine. Wow. If it's, I don't know, it just, I don't know, call me crazy, but it would seem to me if I give a pregnant woman an anti, I mean, an influenza vaccine, don't I have to make sure it's that strain of influenza at that particular time and all Actually this stuff? Actually matches what's out there in the environment and isn't going to make them sick. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Man, I tell you, I, if I ever get, if I ever lose my job as a radio talk show host, I'm going on the anti-vaccination <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. This, this really is nuts, and, and I, I, I come from a community of people who, on the one hand, and I am going to speak really honestly and plainly, who on the one hand distrust government historically because of what we've been through as a, as a culture and as a race, but then on the other hand trust government with this particular in, issue um, with their own children, and, it's, and it's, it, it's actually making me very upset right now. 
Um, let's go to the question. Hello. Um, I first want to say thank you so much to all of you for standing up here and speaking truth. I know it's made a big difference in my life and for my children's lives, so thank you for that. Um, but can we go back to the pertussis deaths that we were talking about, the 300-something? Do, do you know if those 300 were partially vaccinated, vaccinated, unvaccinated? Do you, does it even say? don't know. Uh, I might have it well, in my well, I, 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 I don't have it in mind. I can speak to that. We have about 20 infants in the United States that die every year of pertussis or whooping cough. They're almost all three months and younger. And, and so the majority of those will have either only had one vaccine at two months or have not been vaccinated yet. That's because the newborn infants are the most susceptible yeah. to pertussis and they have not gotten the vaccine yet. So that's where the deaths are occurring. But the vast majority of all the rest of the cases are occurring in fully vaccinated older children. But they survive the disease because it's only a dangerous disease for newborn babies. So Pertessa is actually whooping cough. Yes. We know. Yes. Okay. That, did you guys know that? You knew that? Uh, I'm the dumb one. <laughs> I was kind of not informed, though. Uh, Quickly getting informed. <laughs> uh, Ma'am. So, the what training do physicians have if they they say it's one in a million? It's very rare that you're going to have a vaccine injury side effect. Um, what are what are you trained to see as physicians so that you can actually document that there's a connection there? So that they can, I mean, whether it be taken to vaccine court or all the way down the road, how are you trained to diagnose that? Because if they don't even know, how are they saying one in a million? You can't. We're being diagnose. told one in a million. Great. That's what the industry says. Right. But and actually, what Diane Harper says is what the industry considers a low risk is one in ten thousand. She said that in my interview. She she worked as a, a consultant for Merck on Gardasil. Um, but physicians aren't trained, and I've been told by a patient who's a resident that he witnessed a vaccine reaction and said to the attending, we need to report this, and the attending said, we don't report them. We are not reporting that, and you are not to report it. Um, but I can tell you that most physicians I talk to have never heard of the vaccine compensation program or VERS and don't know that they're supposed to report it. I actually didn't either. I, I came out of med school in 86. I think we're kind of same time, you and I. And that was the year that Congressional Act was written. It didn't really get enacted for another year. I was never informed um, when I did my PEDS residency starting in 86 that we were supposed to report reactions, that there was a reporting system, that well, there think, was a I compensation. Think question is, is, are we trained to no. recognize reactions? No. We're other than, not, no. Not, we're, no. We're trained that they are coincidental and that they probably would have happened anyway, even if you hadn't gotten the vaccine. And so they just, you know, we don't write them down. They don't matter because it's just coincidence. That, I mean, that's what we're trained I to I was believe. told that the see, like we did see, like in, I have to say that there were some attendings who said, oh, this kid is having a febrile seizure and he was in the vaccine clinic today and that's secondary from fever from the but vaccine. the thing though, Tony, is that if you go to, if, if, if a vaccine reaction occurs, like you think that you've had one and the doctor says no, like I have two girls in my practice that are vac vaccine injured from Gardasil. When by the time they got to me, in the one girl, I was the 18th physician, and the other girl, I was the 19th physician that they saw. Because the underlying pathology is, so, you know, they have POTS syndrome, they have mm -hmm. seizures, they have asthma. They put, are put through the $900 million medical workup to prove it was anything but the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So they're always looking for what was underneath this, because what was in that vial was holy water. It just blessed them. It didn't cause any problems. And so we're not, so, the, the, uh, so what we're trained to diagnose, but not diagnose in association with what, right. ha what came through that needle. Right. Great question. Ma'am? Um, you know, to speak on that, what I've been told about the adverse reactions, that they don't report it um, from, you know, my pediatrician that we had, um, had said that these are expected normal reactions. They only report things that are out of the norm. So if your child has 105.1 fever like my son did, and screamed for several hours. Um, it's not reported that's expected. You know, they told you that this could happen. Um, you know, my daughter has um, just had a baby, and earlier this, um, you know, she was pregnant this year, and the doctor was fighting with me for her to get the immunizations. And finally he gave up and was like, fine. Then in the exam room, I asked him, I said, you know, she's not gonna have any Novocaine, but she just has, needs a little bit of bonding on her tooth. Can I go and get that done? 
he says to me, he goes, well, you know, even things that we know that are absolutely 100% safe, and we know we've known this for years, we prefer to do these things after pregnancy because you never know what they find out years later. <laughs> so I looked at my son-in-law and I'm like, did he just contradict himself? Because he wanted to give her three immunizations, you know? But one of the battles that I have with um, physicians is, and I say to them, just explain to me, because I'm just a mom, how do these rates go, I mean, I'm 52, how do these rates go from one in 10,000 is what I remember hearing about autism, autism scale, to now it's like one in 52, you know, the studies vary. And I say, how can this be? And they will sit there and argue with me and just say, oh, you know, we're, we've gotten better at diagnosing. You know, we didn't diagnose these kids. And they're including ADHD and this and that, you know. Um, yes, so what do we say? What do you say to the physicians that tell you um, we, there, are not, there are not more cases of autism on, this, on the spectrum? Argue, you can't, you're not going to argue with your physician. Yeah, there's, there's no point not, arguing there's with There's no your point. Physician. Now you can drop every a, doctor I've met has said that. You can drop a seed, a plant a seed like we talk about in our course, and just say, this might be something for you to consider. Say something, drop the mic and go away. You're not gonna change their mind. You're just you're just wasting so their they time and they ask that a question, so if, if you ask because I've, I've, I, it kind of seems to me if you ask an informed question of that physician, he kind of may start treating you differently because you're kind of an informed consumer. Exactly. It, it depends like on the physician. It's the rare physician who's that open minded when it's been drilled into them constantly that vaccines are safe, that vaccines gotcha. are safe. So what would you all say about, is there, is there a huge increase in autism, or is it yeah. only really, better really diagnosing? That, that, that's yeah. really, I think huge. the fact that, the, that the, our doctors have backed into the corner and that's the final, that's where they're going to stake their claim is autism has always been here, means we have totally won this discussion. Because if you look back historically, we know this was a new, it arrived in, in 1938, 1943. Leo Kanner reports on it. Physicians flew from all over the world to meet his little handful of kids that had this new special problem. If it was everywhere, why were they flying from all over the world to visit these kids and figure out what was going on? Why, was did, why did none of the great diagnosticians of, of, of all times, from Tourette's and Freud, who just went into insane asylums, where if you had a kid that had autism back then, you just threw them right into an insane asylum. No one tried to keep them or train them or do anything. Where were they? All they were doing was going through insane asylums and writing every malady they could find, charcoal, all of them. We don't have a single description of what we know to be you know, severe autism anywhere in history. And if it was here, it means we've passed one and a half billion people had autism before 1938, if we've always been at one in 52 or one in 36, and they just discovered, we just recognized they were walking amongst us in 1943, it's insane and they've totally lost this argument. That's the other thing you have to ask them. Thank you. Thank you. Fed classes, where you read in the newspaper every single day, there's, you know, schools have to build special playgrounds. Communities have to build special sensory playgrounds. There is no place to put these kids that are aging out. If they always existed, how come that was not an issue before? And Universities they, are developing new programs. How do we deal with the, the autistic influx we're getting? We're reading and about and it every day. physicians that couldn't recognize hand flapping, spinning, right. toe walking, they should have all had their <laughs> license removed, right? <laughs> You know? Okay, I have a question. You maybe, um, maybe you intend to address it later in, in your talk. So, um, as you know, they're always using herd immunity. That's, That's yeah, coming. We'll That's okay, coming. so, so, it's so. The, in detail. I figured it would be. So, <clears throat> but I didn't know if you're also going to address the rising rates of cancer, yeah. the relationship to natural infection versus artificial immunity. I don't know how to refer Probably. to that, I, yeah, well, uh, and the and the proportional relationship to cancer and how cancer is increasing. Possibly, there's studies showing about infection actually reducing yeah, yeah, the yeah, incidence yeah, of cancer. Fine. You're going to co cover that later. Okay. okay, thank you. So I just want to say thank you all for being here, and also um, I have a million questions, but I had to narrow it down because I can only do one. So fluoride and aluminum. Are you going to cover that? Um, I'm not really going to cover fluoride. I, 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 I know it's an issue. Hmm? That's something I've been reading 
about how it help you know it travels to your brain. It helps the aluminum travel to your brain. Okay, one, one of the things that there's a um, uh, Anastronica and others have looked at is uh, these compounds called aluminofluoroaluminates, uh, which are aluminum fluoride compounds, and they seem to be very harmful. And, and fluoride in general in your body is probably not a good thing. They, 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 the Cochrane, again, before Cochrane got totally, totally confused in their, in their relationships to the pharma, pharma, had looked at, you know, the whole thing about uh, uh, fluoride in teeth. So what they concluded was, well, fluoride, they didn't even talk about toxicity issues. They, they said fluoride in the water supply does pretty much nothing. When you apply it to your teeth and take it off again, it does actually strengthen your enamel. So that was, that was a conclusion. But fluoride is, is, is known to have neural consequences if you Im imbibe enough of it. So you know, making these aluminum fluoride compounds is probably not a good thing. Although I, you know, one of the things I would will you know, maybe talk about, touch on later is that there is actually an adjuvant that, that was developed by GSK in in Europe that actually is a calcium fluoride compound that apparently is a fabulous adjuvant. To which my question to the guy who developed it was, well, uh, did you not worry about what the fluoride might do in your brain? No, we didn't think about that. Okay. No. And then, mm -hmm. uh, just one other thing: acid reflux. I have so many parents that tell me that. Their child has acid reflux. Oh, yeah. Does that have anything to do with vaccines? Yes. Those Thank are you. hepatitis B. Both. Well, and it could because aluminum mm -hmm. causes a, a autonomic dysfunction. Yeah. And reflux can be an autonomic dis sign of autonomic dysfunction. Auto, I'm sorry. Autonom the autonomic nervous system, which it's the unconscious nervous system that controls every func pretty much everything. Um, it is greatly affected, seems to be also greatly affected by aluminum in the brain. And reflux is a sign of autonomic dysfunction. Exactly. So it, it's Thanks. very possible. Our last question, and then, then we're going to have a 15-minute you know, break. I know many of you probably want to stretch your legs. I know I do. So, I just want to say, again, echo what others have said. Thank you so much for what you have done. And um, my sister and I were totally honored, Dr. Tenpenny, when you shared our article in your boot camp about the HHS lawsuit. So thank you. But how is it possible that um, organizations such as the CDC and all can go against the government orders to conduct these studies. How are they allowed to do that? I had that written down. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, that's a great question, yeah. Because you said that. I think one of you said they, they asked the CDC to do a study, and they said no. We've actually funded it. They're sitting on a pile of money that's there to pay for the vaxxed versus unvaxxed study. I think it's, it's sort of a shell game where the government points at yeah. the CDC and the CDC points back at the government yeah. and they play this game where we actually try to pick sides and think right. someone's against somebody. I mean, why is our government not calling Dr. William Thompson and the five scientists involved in the fraud at the CDC over the MMR vaccine clearly laid out in the film Vax? They won't do it for what I said. The government's in trouble. We have a serious problem with confidence in, 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 in public perception if they finally investigate what they know they have to investigate. The CDC is the government, Yeah. Right. okay? That's HHS right. is the they government. The, the FDA government. is the government. Right. I mean, w why are we not upset that the FDA has just decided to not look at glyphosate in every food product when yes. they said they were going to? Right. These government agencies no longer represent us. Our government, as you've pointed out, no longer represents us. That's the problem. The, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is now the largest, most powerful lobby in Washington. It's outspending oil and gas two to one. That means that they are buying all of your next politicians. When you go and vote in November, you better start asking these questions. Who is funding them? Because if they are, this is no longer, we are losing grasp of a government for the people by the people. It is becoming a government for the industry by the industry, and that's why we find ourselves in this. It's, uh, and specifically, it's 720. Specifically so, the study he's talking about, just as a side note, ho, ho, the $5 million set aside to do this study. It was the head of the interagency on autism, Dr. Insel, who actually defunded it because he didn't like the optics of it. That was a quote, So it's, it's 720. We'll, we, we, uh, 15 minutes, that means uh, back at 735. <laughs> okay? okay? Right? Please come back in about 15 minutes. The bathrooms are located out the door and downstairs. And the next block is all about are vaccines effective?